bases dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down here. It is a Wednesday. It's a midweek in MLS. No games in the midweek. Get used to that. We're not going to have a bunch of those this season. That's a, it's a different feel than it was last season where it felt like they were cramming games in at different points of the season. Not so much this time. We will have a lot of Atlanta United 2 games in the midweek, as we do tonight. It is a preseason game against the Chattanooga Red Wolves. But that'll be on twitch.tv slash A-T-L-U-T-D tonight. I'll have the call for you there. Um, unfortunately, some technical difficulties. No high school game of the week tonight with Pike County and Whitewater. Um, would love to see Pike County at some point this season. One of the, the most exciting attacking teams on the boys' side in the state. Whitewater's undefeated as well. But technical difficulties. We're not going to be able to do a broadcast out of Fayetteville tonight. Um, hopefully we'll be able to see those teams again, maybe John in state championship action later on. Yeah. I, the, uh, Pike County has one of the most prolific goal scorers in the state, uh, scored 32 goals on the boys side in their first eight matches. So average that out. That's four doing basic math. But yeah, when you've got one of the, the biggest goal scorers in the state, you want to see how they can uh, balance things out a little bit and see if uh, Pike County can make it into the postseason. Looking forward to seeing if they can make that run and uh, make Zebulon proud. They're undefeated. They're balancing things out pretty good. Pretty but, good. You know, when you get into brackets, anything can happen. That's just all I'm saying. I have faith in Pike County. John does not have faith in Pike yeah, County. Right. I do. Right. Zero faith in Pike County. I'm just you saying that, this is March. Things out, this, this is March. That's all I'm saying. When we hit this March, isn't basketball. Brackets are brackets, my friend. <laughs> and most of mine get blown up after week two. All right, Jared, I'm I'm really confused, and I think I'm afraid that we might get more confused because John is going to try to explain to us everything going on in England right now. <laughs> uh, and it is very hard to follow with uh, lots of different factors into it. But you had about five different points from England on our notes today. So uh, lead us away into England because I need some explanation here. What do you want on the field or off? That's the first question. You're in charge, John. Uh, all right. So then let's go with uh, off the field and with the most recent stuff. Uh, oh, hold on. Let's make sure Jarrett's alive. Are you live, Jarrett? Yes. Yeah, I'm just kind of bracing. Okay, I mean, you didn't say anything on the show, so you know you've been touch and go here for a while, according to you. So I'm just I'm checking in. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I have been touch and go, but y'all also didn't let me get a word in edgewise. I just <laughs> I just kind of stepped back. Trying, I was trying to get it to you, and it just plowed on through. My bad. Sorry. Jeez. All right. All right. Go Jeez. ahead, Mr. Plow. Keep going. Nah, he's the plow. Go. Wow. All right, so let's start with the Everton and the morning update. And about an hour ago, Everton put out a four-sentence statement, uh, basically in sentence number three, showing support for Vitaly Mikolenko and his family and will continue to do so with the events. Um, sentence four of the release is the one that is the, uh, the, the big one here, where Everton says they can confirm it is suspended with immediate effect all commercial sponsorship arrangements with the Russian companies USM, Megaphone and Yota, and that is in direct relation to uh, 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 contributor uh, Alasir Usmanov. Uh, so right now, Usmanov has his uh, business tentacles in a bunch of different elements of Everton, whether it is Everton's women's jersey, which is the Megaphone sponsorship. Uh, he has the right of first refusal right now to be uh, the title sponsor for the new ground and the stadium that they're planning on, on the on the seaside. So this seems to be the, the first step in distancing themselves from Alisar Usmanov, who had his assets frozen by the EU yesterday. Then you get into the Chelsea situation. Hold, hold up, hold up on Everton. Yeah. Uh, you said contributor. What is that? What does that mean? It means that he's not like I'm trying to. to I'm who owns Everton? Uh, Farhad Moshiri is the okay. owner of Everton and Alisar Usmanov is a financial contributor who's and uh, airborne DJ and others who are, are Everton supporters can, can aid in the, my translation here. But uh, Alisar Usmanov is an Uzbek who gives a lot of financial support to Everton. And it is uh, that they're trying to figure out 
whether or not Usmanov has unfair influence over Moshiri and Everton, especially in the hiring practices of Frank Lampard and whether he had more say in it than he said publicly. So there's a, a lot of uh, there are a lot of issues where uh, Usmanov is concerned when it comes to his actual involvement with Everton versus what he says his involvement. So he recommended a former Premier League manager to be hired. That's really going out on a limb. Well, uh, as someone who doesn't have ownership in the club, the issue was that should he even be in the process since he's not an owner, even though yeah, he's you, that, that feels like a reach. I understand the issues with the assets being frozen and all that, but you have outside advice, consultants, et cetera, all the time. Um, Now, if there's a financial consideration being paid to get to that point, that's a different conversation. If it is just, uh, hey, I'm a sponsor or I'm an investor or contributor or whatever we want to call the thing. And because I'm putting money into your product, I'd like for you to do this. He'd be a really good hire. It's not a crazy hire. It doesn't feel like that would be an issue, but I don't know. I think more of it's going to be, Jared, if, if one of your key financial contributors has their assets frozen uh you're going to be in trouble in terms of doing anything you need to do i don't know where their financial situation is but if they're waiting on more money from usmanov uh, they're not going to get it if his assets are frozen yeah yeah you're um you're kind of in a weird spot uh chelsea also come on down grab a seat at the table in for being in a in a different That's kind more of direct, weird spot yeah yeah, um, but still in a weird spot, and you know this is uh, this kind of what happens when everything is interconnected geopolitically. Uh, things get sideways, and they have knock-on effects. Uh, obviously, not nearly as severe as the people in Ukraine right now. Um, of course, of course. But as far as your clubs in England and in other countries where you have investments direct or otherwise, yes, these are going to be knock-on effects that uh, that you have to deal with, and this is. Um, you're going to have to make some decisions and you know, whether that is clubs deciding, you know, people deciding I'm going to sell my stake in the club or I am going to, you know, put it in kind of a blind trust for somebody else to handle just to separate myself from it temporarily. However you go about that. There's a couple different options there, but you're going to have to deal with both the financial ramifications and the PR ramifications. Yeah, I mean Everton's different, right, John? And the, they have a yeah, separate... yeah. I don't mean to, I don't mean to call them like exactly. No, like I, I know, I know. I'm, I'm just trying for people who might not know all of the, the differences and details. I, I do want to clarify it. So Everton is getting money from companies and or a person with multiple companies, right? That now those assets are frozen. That is an issue. But Everton is in solid ownership. Yeah, Farhad Mashiri is the owner. Got it. Commercial ties are where Usmanov is brought into Everton and the Usmanov owned company that owns the training or that owns the, the sponsors, the training ground. Sponsors Moshiri them. is the chairman of that company. Okay. That's all, all, all that's fine, yeah. but that's not ownership. That's a different conversation. Right. Now, Chelsea is more complicated because it is direct ownership and, Correct me if I'm wrong, Abramovich's assets have not been frozen Correct. as of yet. Correct. Which some people have an issue with because there's a little bit of, well, here, but not here, and why. And also there are reports that the club is up for sale from Abramovich because of everything going on. And what, $2 billion? Well, right now there it, it's conflicting reports because we're seeing numbers anywhere from $2 billion to four. Four is what some folks are saying Abramovich wants because he wants two billion plus the billion and a half that he's loaned to the club so far. Yeah, of course. I mean, I I want as much as I can get. It's, it's going to be somewhere between two and four. That's probably about ten different people who could make that purchase, right? Right. And you're looking at a conglomerate of some sort that would be coming in to do that. I would assume if yeah. it does happen. Yeah, and one of the names that uh, the one of the guys that has come forward to the Telegraph and said that yes, I have been one of the ones who has been contacted is Hans Jörg Weiss, uh, who is an 86 year old Swiss born billionaire, 
and he has said that that four billion is too much. He could go in at two, but he wouldn't do it by himself. Obviously, he would come in with a, with a consortium as well. And for those that don't know about Hans Jörg Weiss, Weiss sold his medical company to Johnson and Johnson back in 2012 for almost 20 billion dollars, and he is one of the uh, most wealthy donors to charities that is out there. He signed the giving pledge with uh, Bill Gates. And so he's giving away half his fortune before he passes. He's established a foundation, but he has come forward and said that, yes, I'm one of the four folks that have been contacted about this sale. Can't do four, could probably do two, but I won't do it by myself. Yeah. Um, Jared, we've had this conversation for years and, and Newcastle was the one that really made sense if you were looking to invest and grow a value because you could get Newcastle and they got it for uh, somewhere between three and three fifty um, in the ballpark of that million and Chelsea, which has been invested in and blown up and is now you're talking two to four. There's just not many people who are going to make that kind of a, a deal because where is the growth? Um, however, I mean, this is different than Everton because Chelsea and their owner that's in a very different situation. If assets are frozen, how does Chelsea operate? It's more complicated. It is more complicated. And I mean, you're going to have to get used to the fact that going forward, we're not going to be in a world anymore where it's one individual owner, you know, one person's in charge of the club, they own the club. It's like, no, you've got like 10 people in the world who can do that when you look at the valuations of what clubs are now and the asking prices for clubs. So what you end up with is ownership groups. Uh, you just want to make sure you have a good ownership group and you don't end up with like Atlanta Spirit Group sort of thing. Yeah. Not that anyone will end up with that. Hopefully they don't. I wouldn't <laughs> no. wish that on anyone. No. But you're not going to, even even the Arthur Blanks of the world, you're not going to run into. I mean, yes, you have those kind of people who have the money, but they're not going to drop $4 billion on a franchise based on valuation. And, At that or, level, look, yeah. Chelsea, Chelsea's valuation is a little, a little high. Um, they would know. probably rather buy, uh, God, I'm trying to think of another, what's another club we could do, like Norwich or something. But no, they wouldn't. Like, no, no, that's the thing. That, that's where you I don't, don't think, think so. it's that. No, I don't think it's that simple. If if you're Mr. Vice here and, and you've got twenty billion or ten billion or fifteen or whatever, you're not gonna you're not looking for a long term rebuild of of a Norwich or a, a club like that. Newcastle was the one. Newcastle was the one that you put the money into it, you do it correctly, then you can be a mega power in the Premier League. That was it. There's not another easy one. Um, if you if you have the ambition, and that's why I think there's a difference between people who would buy Norwich and people who would buy Chelsea. If you have that ambition to to talk about Chelsea, Norwich doesn't interest you. No offense. It, it, it's just you can't be Chelsea if you're Norwich. It's not going to happen. You would have to build a much larger stadium. You would have to do so much in infrastructure. If you have the means, why would you? If you don't have the means for a Chelsea, then we're having a different conversation, right? You're not in the running for a Chelsea. Then you would buy a smaller club and try to build them up. I, I, I think I've, I've seen that thrown around like, you know, oh, you'd rather just buy a smaller team that's less expensive and then you're good. We're talking different worlds here, in my opinion. Um, the Sorry, biggest... you're, you're trying to drag, you're potentially trying to drag teams into that top into that 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 upper echelon with just pure financial force which is tough and we've been over this before as well it's a separate issue but we've been over look the big six didn't want to let uh newcastle in for sure Um, and yeah it doesn't matter that manchester city was an also ran that got bought up by a lot of oil money and became part of you know the mega powers chelsea wasn't chelsea before abramovich right yeah they don't they don't want to let more more uh they don't want let more in the clubhouse clubhouse is getting a little crowded for them based on their perception of it and it's not easy but i mean speaking just as me and i don't have the billions to throw around for something like this i would rather buy a smaller club build it up build the valuation because franchises are long-term investments anyway if you're going to go strictly from the financial sense of it but i see your point though that you know it's not 
you're not getting the same kind of people, of course, to buy a yeah. smaller club versus buying a Chelsea. Yeah. That's where yeah. I'm at. Is it's you just can it's a different people together, maybe. Right. It's just a different conversation between the two. Um, if you're if you go in and and you're trying to be, people are trying to convince you that yes, you can be one of the top clubs in the in the country, and you can make all these things, and you can win these trophies. Uh, here, come by Norwich. You're not talking to the same people. I don't think. Um, if, I mean, for example, the, the people ended up buying Newcastle when that was being dragged out and difficult and all of that, they would have went somewhere else if there was a comparable buy and there wasn't, um, the thing that that I think complicates this is, you know, we're, we're not talking about a business operating in the UK that is a store that is, you know, uh, just a, a regular company. You're talking about a football club that has a different kind of impact. And and we see some countries that provide, you know, even more protection for football clubs from going bankrupt, for example, and, and those sorts of things, because they see it as a social institution. Uh, Argentina's basically prevented clubs from going bankrupt forever because they, they see them as institutions, not businesses. I would very, I, I would wonder where this conversation is going to go the longer it drags out about Roman Abramovich and Chelsea. Um, and I'm sure it is a very conflicted conversation for Chelsea fans. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing all the way around to, to resolve, but it's going to have to be sooner rather than later. I mean, there's reports, John, if I'm not mistaken, that Chelsea could have new ownership by the time they play their next Premier League game against Newcastle in about 10, 11 days time. They might have to do it that fast. Yeah, they might have to if assets are frozen and the, 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 the world economics lean to where they have been with the EU and freezing of assets and, and, seizing of assets basically now I mean, the the one thing burn says um well seizing's getting into a different conversation um i don't think that's happened in the uk yet and the uk is not the eu anymore so that's a whole different conversation to begin with right um but burn points out if the owner's assets are frozen then the club just can't make any financial losses which the owner would then need to make up for with capital contributions i don't know if it's that simple i honestly don't know here i don't know if I I don't know the ownership of Chelsea exactly. If they're talking about freezing assets or freezing businesses owned by this individual, can Chelsea operate is the question I would have. And I don't know if there's an answer out there. I I mean, we're all talking hypotheticals, right? I don't know if things are frozen, if that would include the club's accounts. Um, I don't know. I don't know their structure and, and how things are going. I think, you know, and maybe some people tried to throw shade at Abramovich for the, the idea of putting them in the trust and that kind of thing. Um, I think he was trying to protect the club. I, I don't think that was anything other than that. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the resolution here is outside of selling it. And you don't, last time I checked, Jared, you, you don't make a two to $4 billion sale um, overnight. Those things don't happen that fast, but in this case, it's going to happen. Have to happen faster than anything we've ever seen. I think. Yeah, it's there's this isn't a uh, this isn't meeting up at the police station at eleven thirty to sell your PS4 on Craigslist. This is there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot that goes into it, and it will be uh, it will be interesting. Um, hell of a week for Chelsea. I mean, between. The shootout to end all shootouts ending with your goalkeeper hitting a ball that uh, I believe that ball actually uh, deflected off of Michael Bradley's penalty that was taken in the CONCACAF Champions League final a few years ago. They were both uh, they both have had their orbits uh, redirected a bit. Yep, throwing the shade at Kepa, missing the eleventh <laughs> penalty uh, of of. You 11. brought him on because he's a PK specialist, and he allowed eleven straight PKs in. Um, Jared, I'm going to go back and give you some numbers as to why that was incorrect. You weren't with us because you were near death on yes. Monday. Um, yes, I was. The last three times they had done this, it worked when they brought on Kepa. This time it didn't. That doesn't mean it's the wrong move. Second, the actual penalty save percentages from Mendy and Kepa 
it's an over 20% difference between the two. Kepa's that much better. So everything pointed to making the move. It didn't work out. It doesn't mean it's a bad move. Doesn't Recent mean I can't make fun of it. Outcome bias. I mean, you can make fun of it, but you can be wrong in making fun of it. That's cool, too. That has never stopped me. No, it has not. Oh, trust me. I know that. Jeez. Known you for a long time, Jared. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, the yeah, Chelsea is going to have a very interesting group of decisions to make because depending on who buys this club, if it comes down to that, are they going to want to keep up that same level of investment in buying? Are they going to want to be as... Um, Anytime you change, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. What's the word to use here? Uh, uh, loose with the purse. You're just willing to take on losses. I mean, willing to yes. invest. You know, are they going to run it tighter? Is it going to be different? I mean, all that stuff comes into play. Anything else on Chelsea specifically from uh, your notes, uh, John? No, I mean, that's that's where we are right now and just trying to figure out who else, if there are four that have been contacted, who are the other three? And where do they fit in the, the notion that uh, we're discussing with Vice and where are they when it comes to their purse strings and do these four even combine? Obviously, that's conjecture, but... When you're looking at four four groups looking to chase Chelsea, we allegedly know one. I, I just want to know who the other three are and see where the race begins because this is something that's going to have to probably be picked up pretty quickly. One thing to keep in mind that, that complicates it, and John mentioned it in terms of the sale price, uh, Chelsea is in debt to Roman Abramovich for 1.51 billion pounds um, because of those in, infusions of cash. So how does that get resolved it's one thing if you're in debt to the owner for you know a few thousand even a few hundred thousand if you are uh, that kind of loaded you, know, you might write that off for the good of the club 1.51 billion when your assets might get frozen slash seized uh, that's kind of important so how that gets handled is, is not going to be an easy one uh, what else is going on in england john you had uh you had a uh, gummy bear cup yesterday, had a couple of matches and a very cool maneuver by uh, Manchester City naming Alexander Zinchenko as team captain and their their win against Peterborough, two goals in seven minutes, and they advanced to the next round. And then also on the board, you had... Uh, it was not gummy bear cup, John. Oh, it was uh, which one was it? The other cup. Oh, Carabao Cup. Cup. Okay, that's right. No, yeah. The Carabao Cup's the... Carabao Cup was the one from last weekend. I'm kidding John, right. you're the England guy. Come on, man. And then on the other side, you had uh, Crystal Palace. Apparently, I don't know if it was a rainy night or not, but uh, Stoke lost two to one when it came to uh, that particular competition. And then Spurs gets bumped out of the FA Cup by uh, Josh Coburn's goal as Middlesbrough knocks off uh, Spurs one nil. So Spurs advance. And Crystal Palace advances. Manchester City advances. There are a couple more matches today, and a couple and uh, one tomorrow. I believe the Borum Wood match is uh, part of part and parcel to the FA Cup coming. That's just disturbing, frame. John. Don't do that, please. <laughs> well, it, you're always looking out for the the little guy, and so today you've got three more, and uh, the Borum Wood Everton match, and once again with Everton, it will be interesting tomorrow. That's the uh, other one that's attached to it. And then we even have one five days from now to close out the round with Nottingham Forest and Huddersfield. So uh, big wins yesterday for a couple of clubs. And then uh, Leicester won yesterday, the return of Jamie Vardy in Premier League action for the first time this year. Jamie Vardy returns. So Vardy and James Madison score. Leicester gets a win. Big three points for Brendan Rodgers. Okay. Um, anything else from England? That's it? I think that's plenty. Okay. I, I, I guess. Um, Jarrett, what's going on in your beloved Scotland? Anything interesting? I mean, not really. Um, <laughs> not anything other than usual. Just Celtic plays today. Everybody's all riled up about everything in general. Um, yeah, Rangers they haven't played playing well today. Since, they actually haven't played great since they beat Rangers. It's kind of, <laughs> it kind of was a uh, Pyrrhic for them. Um, both of them dropped points over the weekend in hilariously embarrassing ways. Uh, the split is coming sooner rather than later, so Jason Stupid. will get mad. Stupid. <laughs> Dumb. I mean, it, it, the, the, the hilarious part of this is that after only one year, Celtic is actually still in pretty decent shape to get a possibly a double, maybe even a treble. Um, just because... Rangers can't get out of their own way ever since the new year. 
to self well, Steve, giving them left. opportunities. Yeah. Um, well, Giovanni Brockhorst had them playing pretty decent after you get that new management bounce. And I wondered if it was going to be a bounce or if that was a permanent, hey, we got things going. It appears to have been just a, a short term bounce. Yeah, I don't even, I mean, it's not the same situation as you'd normally get. It wasn't like Stevie G was fired. He he, he left no. for another gig. Well, they were so I don't think you get a when same he kind of left, bounce. though. True. Uh, probably distraction with, I mean, he had been linked to every job under the sun before he left. Yeah. So probably a little bit of a distraction. So, yeah, Rangers keeps uh, tripping over their own feet, even though Celtic are giving them plenty of opportunities. And then Celtics tripping over their own feet because Rangers are giving them opportunities. And Scotland is still Scotland. It's uh, The biggest thing for them is right now they are, they've reached out to offer whatever they can to uh, Ukraine's federation because they are supposed to play Ukraine in the uh, World Cup qualifier coming up here this month, I believe. And they have reached out and basically said, you know what, let us know what we can do. Yeah, um, I, that, and that's the one we don't know. Uh, there's been resolution on Russia playing in competitions. That's not going to happen. But with Ukraine, we just don't know until we get a little bit closer to it. Uh, one other thing on the Chelsea fallout kind of stuff. Um, we've mentioned a, a few different players that are out of contract with Chelsea in the summer. I can't imagine the current situation is helping in terms of re-signing these guys. And other clubs are going to take advantage. Um, Fabrizio Romano reporting that Barcelona has improved the contract proposal for Andreas Christensen in the last 48 hours. Five-year deal on the table. Xavi wants to sign him. Bayern's trying to. Barca's confident in getting it done. Doesn't look like he's going to go back to Chelsea. Uh, Rudiger is another one whose name has come up that everybody is going after at the moment. So that's another element of the the Chelsea situation. It could get complicated as we move along. Um, Liga MX last night, Club America drew at home with Carretero. Um, Santiago Solari is still employed as of now. It might not be very long, according to reports coming into this midweek and weekend set of games. Four points was the minimum. Well, he got one, so now he's got to get three on the weekend and they've only won one time in their last 13 games. So it's not looking very good. Um, red cards, both ways in that club America Carretero game. It's just, it's a matter of time. And, you know, if it happens this weekend, it happens this weekend. If it's not till next week, it's next week. Solari is not going to see out the rest of the season at club America. And we'll see where he ends up next. Um, maybe he sits on the sideline and waits for an MLS job to open up. Would, makes some sense with his ties to the United States. Um, Jason Nix throws this out there and it was talked about this morning in different places that, you know, now you've got all the tabloids who are taking a break from the Manchester United players. Hate Ralph Rangnick. Ralph Rangnick doesn't like his players. He doesn't like Cristiano Ronaldo. Ronaldo's doing commercials that are really horrible. They are. Go watch the video. It's terrible. Um, All these different things. Now the new thing is Manchester United wants to go get Carlo Ancelotti from Real Madrid. But if you remember, a couple weeks ago, Real Madrid wanted to kick Carlo Ancelotti to the curb and hire Pochettino because Pochettino had such a different game plan than Ancelotti in their last match, even though it was just PSG did a really good job of preventing Real Madrid from building up out of the back. They weren't just sitting back. They couldn't play because PSG did a good job. But people said Ancelotti was too defensive. Blah, 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 blah. Now, Manchester United reportedly is going to go get Carlo Ancelotti. I said it when that possibility came up of, well, Manchester United might not get Maurizio Pochettino, who they want to get, because he might be at Real Madrid. And I said then, what's very simple, if you're Manchester United, you you hire Carlo Ancelotti. If he's available, they hire Carlo Ancelotti. That would be the smart move. Um it's not going to be Ralph Rangnick coaching the team next year. That's not going to happen. And there's more reports saying like, that's not going to happen. What his level of influence is, I'm assuming it's waning just reading tea leaves and trying not to read tabloids, but they're thrown in your face at all times. Um, I don't think he's going to make the choice. I think they're going to want to go for a Pochettino or an Ancelotti. If Real Madrid hires Pochettino, go get Ancelotti. I think Pochettino is a really good fit for Manchester United. There is the question of, all right, he hasn't won a whole lot in his career. He hasn't been at a club like Manchester United. PSG is a whole different animal. He's won in France, but 
kind of hard not to win in France with PSG, even though he didn't win the league last year. This year, he's doing very well in the league. Very, very well. He is doing very well in Champions League right now. But I don't think he sticks around in Paris no matter what, because it's just a headache constantly. If he's available, that's who Manchester United should hire, in my opinion, because I think he's the right personality for what they need. If he's not, go hire Carlo Ancelotti because Ancelotti's a chameleon when it comes to being a, a manager. He can fit into any situation and get results. Um, you hire one of those two guys, you're fine, and we'll see what direction they go. Let's talk a little bit about, before we jump into MLS stuff, um, Jesse Marsh leads. A lot of talk all the way around it, some ridiculous talk. If you uh, spend too long on the Bird app, you'll, you'll find it. It's really dumb. Um, this is a team, Jarrett, that Marcelo Bielsa and Jesse Marsh have different approaches on the game. I, I think some people have tried to lump them together. I've heard some English pundits also come in and say that, well, Jesse Marsh should put numbers behind the ball and they, they should try to do what they do to stay up. And I'm like, did, did Big Sam give you the talking points? Um, that's not what Jesse Marsh does. Where he's similar to Bielsa is in the fact that they're going to be aggressive with their pressure off the ball. Marsh does it a little bit more on its own rather than to get the ball back and keep possession and then attack quickly. Marsh is a little bit more of we're going to create an opportunity here off of the pressure and try to score off of that rather than than have the ball. But the things that go into making that work, you got to be a fit team. Well, that's something that Bielsa has really stressed at Leeds, so that should be fine. It's a shift, but it's not like Manchester United going from Ole to Rangnick kind of shift where there's no similarity. This is similar but different. Can Jesse Marsh do okay at Leeds walking in the door and still being true to the way he wants to play it. I don't know because I don't know if people are going to give him a fair shake because he's American and it's too easy and lazy to make the Ted Lasso jokes. Um, I don't know if he's going to be given that, um, you know, that, that time afforded. Uh, we know that he did well with a powerhouse and then he struggled in a similar but not as powerhouse situation. But honestly, I just don't trust England to go about this, you know, with a with a good heart, for lack of a better word. Um, because it's just going to be too easy for them to throw the layups of it's an American coach and they're just going to make Ted Lasso jokes. And anytime he gets three points, they're just going to be sitting on edge waiting for him not to get three points. And um, not this similar for me, just the way it went with Bob Bradley at Swansea. I, I kind of, I'm, 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 I am admittedly sour on the way that the English are going to look at American coaches right now because they've shown, they haven't shown me a good excuse of actually being patient with one. And I'm really glad that Marcelo Bielsa had the following he had there. And that it seems like people kind of looked at it as it was time for him to go, but we appreciate everything he did because it was a whirlwind romance and it was a lot of fun. And we really like and appreciate things about him now that we didn't know before. So I'm happy I'll have that. Let's see how it goes with Jesse Marsh. I hope they'll go into it with an open mind. History tells me to expect them to be kind of dicks about it. Well, um, that's different than, than really where I was at. That's going to happen. There, there's no way around that. You're going to get, if he doesn't win game one, you're going to get the tired old comments about American coaches. It's going to happen from the media. Um, I mean, you had the media saying dumb things about Bielsa too. The fans loved him. Uh, Jesse's got to really deal with that effectively um, and embrace what they have become and try to be as much of that as he can. He's got to be himself, obviously. And, and Jesse's a, I mean, I think Jesse's an outgoing kind of a guy here. And I think he will do things to, to make the fans give him an opportunity. Um, they're going to have to be open-minded too, because he's not Marcelo Bielsa, but there are similarities in the play style and where I'm at, Beyond the English media and some English fans are not going to give the American coach a, a real shake here. I, I just accept that at this point. I hate that it's, you know, just understood that that's going to happen, but that's kind of where my head is. I'm, I'm going deeper on this in that 
this feels like the right kind of appointment. And no, not for Jesse Marsh to come in and play bunker ball. That's not what he does. That's, that's just an absurd approach at, at this point, if you're going to do this. Um, for him to do what he does, which is intense pressure off the ball, which is hunting impacts, which is using the press to bridge the gap between talent. Because leads on paper, and this is what a lot of people have said all year, and you can compare rosters, they're not as talented as a lot of teams in the Premier League. And it's a credit to Bielsa to be able to get what he got out of that group. Marsh has got to find a way to bridge that. He goes about it differently, but there are similarities. And I think those similarities will help him. Um, he's got to get it done, and the players have to get it done. And, and they're going to have to respond well to this, and they need to do that for their love for Bielsa, because the last thing he would want is for them to be relegated. Um, he fought and scratched and clawed to keep them up, to get them there first and to keep them up. And he was talking about, at least according to reports, that he would walk away if that was the right move for the club. And it sounds like it was at least somewhat mutual here in him leaving. Okay, now they have to respond. And Marsh has to put them in a place to be able to do that. And I think his game model will fit them. But he's got to be himself. And also, people have to understand that, no, you're not going to all of a sudden turn into bunker ball and sit back and just get numbers behind the ball. I hate that statement more than anything in these situations. And that's what people do. Um, you're right, Jared, in that people will, will shred him for any which thing that they possibly can. If he says something that sounds American, they will shred him. If he... Um, doesn't use some specific piece of terminology, they'll shred it. If he doesn't get a win game one, they'll shred it. I mean, that, that's going to happen. I think Leeds's ownership is very smart, and they know what they're doing here, and they already wanted to bring him in anyway. It's going to gonna be more point, about the results. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and to Burns point, yeah, I don't mean to imply that like Germany or Austria were. Yeah, no, 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 Burn. I, I, no, um, no, that's not what Jarrett said. That's not what I've ever said. That's not, that Germany and Austria different conversation entirely. I'm talking specifically from, England will not give him a fair shake in a lot of circles because he's American. From what I understood, they were very they liked him a lot, and they, if for no other reason, uh, I believe I read somewhere that they were very appreciative of him because he was very determined to learn the language to assimilate into culture and to Austria, be yeah. a part and to be a part of the culture there. And that really, really yeah. won him, won people over for him. Um, for anyone to do that going to England, but England is just, man, I, I feel like if you're not, if you're not, if you're not English, if you're not from the Isles or if you're not already an established, um, you know, world great. It's it's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna come down really hard on you, and there's gonna be a lot of criticism. I mean, you're you know, you're I mean, substandard was, because you're not that you're not English or Scottish when it comes I mean, to any kind of an opportunity like that. Yeah, or or I mean, I mean, you Pat got got flack from people before when he got to City. I mean, it takes time to put stuff in place, so we'll we'll see how it goes. I hope he does get the time, and I you know I hope he is successful. If for no other reason, just to rub it in everyone's face. Um, yeah, Jason, Burns, I don't think the Spanish and Italian coaches get such love in England out of the gate either. I mean, go back to what people said about Pep. And, and <laughs> Pep's as good as it gets. And people are like, hey, he, he, he can't get it done in England. Oh, her, her. No, shut up. Like, at after their success, there is embracing. Mm -hmm. But when there's not that success and straight out of the gate, there's questions if if you're not English. And and it's a shame. It's a shame. I hope that changes. If you're American, it's even worse. And you know, it's 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 going to happen for Jesse no matter what. Now, Burned, I I do think we do have to understand that there's a difference between Leeds and Leipzig and expectations. Um I don't think Jesse Marsh is a guy who was ready. I mean, Jesse basically said it that he was ready to go to Leipzig for the situation that they were in and do well. Um Leeds is different. Can he go and do well? And what's doing well? It's different than what Leipzig's doing well is. Leipzig was expected to be a Bundesliga challenger and go deeper into the, the Champions League than they had done. When we're talking about Leeds, it's staying up. It's being a mid-table team, establishing being a mid-table team. He can do that. Of course, he's got to get better at certain things. No question. But no, I'm I'm not of the mind that just because he won at Salzburg but didn't make the next step at Salzburg with like what they've done in the Champions League this year, 
or he didn't do well at Leipzig that he can't do well at Leeds. Those are all very different situations. And Jesse Marsh deserves a fair shake in this. He absolutely I will, does. I will say that I'm glad we're seeing a couple teams going and getting, you know, bringing in a Steven Gerrard down, who, you know, is a former player, English, but, you know, played a really fun style at Rangers, a style that is still being played in Europe, which, again, if you need a neutral game to watch in Europe, watch Rangers, because they're going to have a game. The over-under on their two games, or the over-under on goals in their two games is probably going to be set around eight or nine. They're going to score and give up a lot of goals. It's very fun if you're in neutral. But teams bringing in Steven Gerrard, teams bringing in a Jesse Marsh, and not, not it doesn't have to just be a former English player, or it doesn't have to be an American, but you're not bringing in Big Sam. God bless you. Taking a little bit of a risk, at least. I just want more open-mindedness in the Premier League. And look, some ownership is going to do that, and they're going to force it, and they're going to force it down people's throats, and they're going to have to accept it. I mean, when you've got leading pundits and people saying that Marcelo Bielsa was naive, get out. Like, stop. Turn your mic off. You can disagree with his tactics. You can think that he should do it differently. There's plenty of managers who think that he should do it differently. But to call him naive is incredibly pompous. The last thing Marcelo Bielsa is, is naive. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was getting into. And frankly, he didn't care for the conventions of playing a certain way. So that's where I get frustrated. And yeah, I, I, I'm i defensive of Jesse Marsh being an American coach in England uh, because I thought Bob Bradley was treated horribly by Swansea and by the media and by all of it. Um, I hope Jesse Marsh doesn't get that. Do I love Jesse Marsh's playing style? Nope. I've told you that many, many times. It, it's not my choice. Um, if I'm picking between him and Bielsa, I'm going to prefer Bielsa because he wants the ball and to create more with the ball. Uh, but even Bielsa's is, is a little more rigid than, than I really care for. That's a taste thing. Jesse Marsh has had success. He deserves this opportunity and he deserves an, a chance to be successful. And I hope he gets it. I hope he gets it. And I hope that England does accept that there are more approaches to the game than theirs, which is honestly kind of hard to define these days. I don't even know what that is anymore because Gareth Southgate is not, you know, Alf Ramsey going back in the day. You know, the game has evolved. The idea of what English soccer is, is different than it used to be. But it's not as easy to define as what Bielsa does, as what Marsh does, as what Rangnick does. And I hope this is what Guardiola does. And I hope that there's an understanding that these guys coming in is really good. Guardiola, Klopp, Tuchel, three of the best of the best. Marsh, really highly thought of as a coach, as a trainer. There are things for him to improve. But you've got to accept that there are different approaches to the game. And I really hope that happens. And I hope it happens from the media side, too. Because, I mean, that's why we we try to dig into the conversation here about philosophy and game model and how tactics are different from that and how some teams have to play a certain way. Some teams can play a different way. There are choices that coaches can make in the way that they play. But we try to have those conversations rather than just, yeah, this guy's naive. He didn't know what he's talking about. They need to put all the numbers behind the ball. You know, there's more, there's more to it than that. We can go deeper. And I hope that in- the English game does. And I hope that Marsh brings a different perspective because, you know, he is along the lines of Rangnick. But I think actually he's got a team that can play that style right now. Rangnick doesn't. That's why as a midseason appointment, that one made no sense. Marsh, as in a follow-up to Bielsa, he's actually got the materials to make it work. He can actually make the cake that you have the ingredients for. That's the, the change here, and I hope that he gets a shot. We'll see. We'll see. He's got to be better defensively than he has been at certain times. He's got to motivate these guys to play the way that he wants, and he's got to get results. But he should get the chance to do that. We'll see. And Marsh has a bit of a window here. It's three matches in his first 11 days. Next match is at Leicester this weekend. Leicester's coming off a short rest from FA Cup and uh, an emotional win. Then they've got Aston Villa at home. Then they've got Norwich at home. 
and there's a window there to get some points and get away from this relegation fight that they're in right now. They're only two points above the bar. So if they can get some points in these first three matches with teams that are right there with you, then it gets Marsh off to a good start. Yeah, and, and that's what he needs, and and we will see. Um, talking about being better defensively, well, anything would be better than Leeds has been defensively. 60 goals conceded in 26 matches, by far the most in the Premier League. Um, I'd like to think that Marsh can at least improve upon that and improve upon it enough to keep them up and then make the additions he wants to make. And I, I hate that you're not wrong, Jason Nix, but I hate that that would even be part of the conversation that, you know, to be concerned about Marsh bringing in Mihailovic, not because it's a bad signing, but because then the media will turn even more because, oh, he's going to get an American. Uh, that'd be a really good value signing. And that's what you're looking for for a club like Leeds right now. You're, you're looking for value. If you're looking for guys more than anything that fit the system. And this is, again, why we have that conversation. Because not every signing is the same for every club, especially when you got a system. You got to sign guys that fit the system, not just sign guys because they're there or because because some agent went on El Chiringuito or some other show or told some tabloid or whatever that this guy's good. No, you got to have somebody that fits the system. I think Mihailovic would fit the system really well. I think he'd do well. So we shall see. We shall see. Um, in MLS. Let's get into the reports yesterday all over the place that Hector Herrera is coming to Houston. We've talked about this before. Uh, Luis Omar Tapia of Today N A had it first. Uh, Tom Bogert had more on it. Everybody else talked about it as well. Um, agreement reached, according to Tapia, um, joined in the summer after his deal with Atleti expires, so it'd be on a free. 10 goals and 93 appearances with the Mexican national team. Yes, he did put his hands on Weston McKinney's throat at one point. Um, I think Houston fans will be able to get over that. Um, hasn't played a ton for Atleti this year. Had been a very important part previously, but not much this year. It's the right kind of signing. Um there's the usual, depending on who you talk to, either this is the greatest signing in the history of the planet or this is a dumb signing because he's 31 years old. For Houston, Jarrett, in a club that does need to activate their potential fan base that follows Eltree and Liga MX very closely um, and getting a guy who was on the La Liga championship side in Atleti last year, Feels like a no-brainer getting him on a free to me. I think it's a good move. What about you? No, I think it's a good move as well. It's a guy who can vigorize that fan base potentially. And a guy who can, frankly, man, he can come in and be that heel in a good way. He yep. can be that guy who is, I don't like him when he's not on my team, but when he's on my team, I love him. And he can contribute on the field. Yeah. Houston's going to need that. Uh, they get a draw week one. It's kind of like yeah, draw against RSL. But Houston, you know, I talked about this, you know, in the uh, the piece that threw up on SDH, you know, hey, this might not be a year where Texas drags the bottom of the basement for uh, the Western Conference. Austin should be better. You don't look too deep in that Cincinnati game. Cincinnati was really bad. Um, but Dallas looked really fun against Toronto. And Houston looks like they're trying to kind of break the shackles of mediocrity a bit. And good. This is the kind of move you have to make. And if it doesn't work, if something goes wrong, if it doesn't fit, that's okay. Try again. Don't be afraid to try. try and don't Houston. don't be afraid to sign thirty year old, thirty one year old guys if it's the right fit. I, it's, yeah. Not every signing has to be a a twenty year old from South America. It doesn't. I, I think that if if I'm spending and I'm prioritizing, that's where I'm going to commit more resources because I think you get more value out of it. But Every team can use a veteran coming in. If you got the designated player spot, and again, it crosses over on the marketing and the fan base side, go get it done. Not every team's built the same way. Not every market's the same. You know, Houston needs a bit of a star. Some other markets might not need that. They need a player who fits the system a little bit more. Uh, there's so many different ways to do this. It's not the same for all 28 teams. We got to stop thinking it is. This isn't a retirement league move either. It's a good move for Houston, I think. He's got to perform. But I think it's a good move on paper. Uh, your beloved Quakes, Jarrett, have lost 
defender Nathan for a couple of months, uh, torn meniscus in his left knee, was injured in the first half of the game. You're already playing Jackson Yule as a center back, and you're playing forwards as wing backs. Uh, Matias Almeida is just going to go completely insane with this move, correct? Uh, yes, uh, Matias Almeida is basically going to turn this into Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory until the end of the season. Um, you know, if they keep dropping bodies, this is going to be a, well, what if I put this over here? What if the liver was up by the heart? What if, you know, what if, what if we just move these organs around so the blood doesn't have to travel as far? What if we just move things around here? What if, you know, what if we, uh, what if, what if we take some of the water out of the body? What if, what if we think, you know, 70% water is a little extravagant? Oh, that He's going to really get creative. Weird. Really fast. He's going to get creative. He's going to make a Frankenstein's monster. It might burn so. down the village, or it might like fall down the stairs on the way out of the castle and break its neck. Yeah, I, he's I, going to make a Frankenstein's monster. I just can't tell you how it's going to end. Good grief! I'm going to have nightmares after Jared goes into soliloquies like that. <laughs> You're welcome. Also, that's no, that's, that's no. Cool. I didn't thank you. No, no, that's not good. If it makes you feel better. I'll just leave now. <sighs> okay, I, I was going to ask you one more, but okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, I want to punish you. Just to, to clarify, Parzival uh, asked if something had changed with Vela, said the guys on extra time said Vela may be negotiating with LAFC on an extension. Uh, yeah, look, this stuff is fluid. Um, we try to keep you up to date on, on the big stories like this as much as we can. We talked about it on Monday. Taylor Twelman tweeted Sunday night that they were negotiating on an extension. So that was after we talked last week about he's out of contract and where is he linked to go. Um, there are still reports that he's going to go to Spain. Um, I don't know if they're going to get a deal done or not, but that's been reported since we talked last week that he's negotiating on a new deal. And there's still reports that he is going to leave. So who knows? That's the thing. We just don't know. And we do our best to try to keep you up to date with all of it as it's being reported. But that's the latest on Fela after his hat trick on the weekend. I have no idea what the uh, most reasonable prediction is here, Jared. No, neither do I. Um, Taylor Twelman's really good at doing that thing where he like just casually drops in like Woj bomb esque stuff in the middle of like him talking on TV. He doesn't like do a breaking colon. Here's the news. It's stream of consciousness, stream of consciousness tidbit that's actually pretty relevant information that you know should. In, in a lot of circles would require its own separate, you know, graph. But yeah, I'm not surprised they're negotiating with him at the very least negotiating with him. So they can try and get something for him. If he does want to leave. Um, now, if now he, I know Taylor mentioned it being a 12 to 18 month extension in that case. Yeah. If you can get him to stay, 18 to 24 stay. month, 18, 18 to 24. I'm sorry. Thank you. No, you're right. 18 to 24. If you can get him to stay, get him to stay because he's been sure. great. And I think if you can get him to stay, and continue to be an ambassador for that club, even when he's done playing, that's an even better win. Now, if he gets done and decides he wants to go back to Spain or wants to go somewhere else to just relax and retire, you know, that's fine. He's done a great service for that club. Um, and I wonder if part of the conversation with him is, you know, hey, let's finish this out. Uh, let's finish out, finish out this season with us. Let's go win a trophy, and then we can talk about moving you on to where you want to go. But if this is what you if what you showed us is what you can give us this year, we would love to keep you around, chase a trophy together, and then see about, you know, if you do want to go back to Spain, we can make that happen. We'll see. And they're probably going to have to sign into a longer deal than maybe they'd like to actually have him for or is reasonable to expect. But that's the only way you're going to get the extension done and guarantee some money and all that sort of stuff. It's all tricky. Um, we'll see if they get it done. Thanks, Jarrett. We'll talk to you tomorrow. You're welcome. Yep. Sounds good. All right. Jarrett is out. Uh, Mike Conti is on deck, but John has to tell us about Eliminize first. I can certainly do that. Eliminize service, proud sponsors of everything SDH QR code over my left shoulder. For those of you watching on Twitch, wrote a free clean fresh here. There's only one place to go, and it is Eliminize service, utilizing enclosed spaces like houses, apartments, and condos. They created a customized solution that eliminizes all organic odors, including those look at cigarettes and food. Realtors and property managers use Eliminize service to eliminate bad odors to help them sell or rent those facilities that much faster. It's a turnkey process that makes it easy to work with said realtors and property managers. Kind of the environment offering a greenway 
to get rid of odors without any kind of toxic residue different than the masking agents that we all use in our homes. Instead of just masking the odors, it attacks the issue all the way down to the molecule. It is a proven scientific formula that does exactly that. Pricing is easy on two ways. I have a cubic foot of parts per million. To make it affordable for you, offering results in 24 hours or less. If you have any questions frequently asked or otherwise, go to the website, eliminize.com, but do us a favor. Add slash Atlanta after the dot com so they know what part of the world that you are talking to them from. E L I M I N I Z E dot com slash Atlanta. Eliminize service proud sponsors of everything. SDH. Welcome in, Mike Conti, hanging out with us. What's up, Mike? How are we doing, guys? Good morning. Doing good. What about you? I'm good. I'm good. Doing really well. Uh, getting ready to head out to Denver tomorrow. Uh, a little day earlier than we thought, but that's cool. Uh, made a nice little dinner reservation for Friday in Denver. So, oh, that's uh, good news. Breaking news. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, breaking news. Um, <laughs> breaking yeah, news no, for me. It, it, no, I mean, <laughs> look, like, things are really good right now. I mean, Atlanta United coming off a really good performance on Sunday. We've got spring weather firing up. Um, you know, I've got our first road trip of the year coming up in a winnable match. So uh, life is good at the moment. Yeah, we'll hear more about Colorado uh, 1030 with Matt Pollard of Last Word on Soccer. Uh, Matt's friend of the show. Excited to talk to him, learn a little bit more about the issues the Rapids are dealing with. But Atlanta United's got some issues they're dealing with, too. Luis Araujo. You know, we were pretty sure by the end of our time report that it was hamstring and that it would be a matter of weeks. Uh, I think it's a good news report that it's I do too. around four weeks is yeah. what's being talked about. That's on the minor side of a hamstring issue. Uh, I, I'm in total agreement. I mean, I, I think the one thing that gave me a little bit of hope on Sunday was that when Louise got hurt, uh, he came back into the technical area in the second half and watched the second half from the bench. Uh, that indicated to me that, you know, he probably didn't tear anything. If he tore anything or did something really, really bad, uh, they'd probably be taking him to a hospital or he'd be getting treatment in back. So, you know, hamstrings are annoying. They're pesky. Um, you know, you cannot rush hamstring rehab, obviously, but what, Let's just kind of put all our cards on the table here. If it is four weeks, the end of that window is an international break. And honestly, the three matches you're going to play between now and then, you should be able to, I would say, get at least seven points, if not the full nine, um, you know, with Moreno in there for Aruju or, or some different permutation of a lineup where Aruju is not included. Uh, if this would have happened at the end of the year, if you're dealing with some match compression and you're looking at a stretch where you're playing, you know, New England and then the New York teams, this could be really, really devastating. The fact that it's going to happen um, in a window where you have an international break and you're playing Colorado, Charlotte, Montreal, where Montreal might be the toughest of those three, maybe. Uh, I feel pretty good that the timing works out for Atlanta United. What you hope is, that it doesn't spill into early April and then that road match at DC and that road match at Charlotte when things really get wound up. That that would be the one hope. But I'm with you. I, I think for the most part, it's good news. But at the same time, Mike, you couldn't have asked for a, a better emergency break glass, grab the, the fire extinguisher moment than pulling Dom Dwyer in in the mid-20s and getting what you got out of Dom Dwyer last time. Yeah, and it, look, I mean, I don't think that's – necessarily sustainable like I, I don't think Dom Dwyer is going to start a right wing for the next three matches but what a great job he did right um and what I didn't realize until he told us in the full-time report I'm sure Jason knew it but I did not that Dwyer's played that position before uh, yeah it's different I mean I think what he was alluding to and this is a credit to Gonzalo Pineda and the structure he set up is you know playing as a traditional right winger yeah, he hasn't played there much, not much at all. But he wasn't playing like a traditional right winger either. He wasn't playing as a second forward. I think there was some confusion about that. They didn't play a 4-4-2. We talked about it in the broadcast that that was a possibility to shift to. 
They didn't. They they played with a front three. But Dwyer, you know, when we think of Adarushu, for example, he's out wide, stretching the field. He's looking to put in a cross, but he's also looking to cut in. Dwyer was always tucked in more. He, it's just where he plays. It's it's what he's used to. So he's it, it's think of it this way: if you have a very famous role on the stage in in a, in a play or in a musical, different people interpret it differently, right? Yeah. That's Dwyer interprets that position differently than Ara Uju. He can do it, but it's going to play out very different and, and you have to adapt to it. And I thought that was where, and we talked about it a lot. Hosechu had to yeah. play differently because Dwyer is a different winger because he's not a traditional one and they made it work. And it's a credit to the, the kind of work that they've put in that is as physical as it is maybe theoretical at times for Atlanta United to be able to say, yeah, let's put a, a traditional forward on the right wing. He knows what we need from a winger, but we also know that he's not going to be able to do all of those things we want from a winger. So we've got to adjust to help him be able to play the role as much as he's got to play the role. And I thought he did a, a really, really good job. He did. Um, he really did. You know, it just speaks to, again, this is why they wanted to bring in veterans who were experienced not only just with soccer in general, but with the oddities of this league. And two of those veterans shone very brightly on Sunday, and that was Ozzy Alonso and Don Dwyer. And I'll admit, like, look, I, I, I had a difficult time processing Don Dwyer being in an Atlanta <laughs> United shirt. I'll admit that. Uh, I wasn't really, like, in love with it when I heard about it. Um, but – the one thing about Dwyer is he came in here and I think he instantly earned the respect of his teammates and went down to Guadalajara and did every single thing that was asked of him and earned a spot on the team as a result. You know, it, it, was, it wasn't like the fix was in and Dwyer was going to air quotes trial and then it'd be on the team. Like he had to earn it and he went and did it. So, um, I think he's he's someone that we're really going to end up embracing here, uh, which, again, like not something I would have even thought would come out of my mouth a month ago. But I think Alonzo is another player who deserves a ton of credit, and I know you guys have been talking about him a lot over the last three days. I think Alonzo uh, is someone who absolutely answered the bell and did everything plus um, in his role on Sunday. And that's what kind of intrigues me now about the next couple of weeks. Um, because you have Alonzo and Sadich doing what they are doing in the midfield, you're not necessarily worried about the midfield altering what you would have to do in the back because you can still play four in the back with Hernandez and Gutman as uh, right and left wing backs, respectively. It opens up options now for your left wing and right wing. Makes you feel a little more comfortable playing a younger guy like Tyler Wolf. Um, I honestly will be very intrigued to see if part of the dominoes falling for Atlanta United lineup wise without Araujo would involve Brooks Lennon playing in a, in a more forward role, um, allowing Moreno to perhaps play centrally. Um, or do you want to play Moreno on the right? Do you want to play Moreno on the left and invert? Well, like th there's a lot of different things you could do, oh, but because. Fun. But because Sadich and Alonzo have your midfield locked down right now, and because you don't worry about your center backs, this gives Pineda room to be creative and not have to select in a, a, a kind of a scared position, right? Like yeah. it, it gives him the ability now to experiment and try some different things and be creative. And it'll be really – I think interesting to see how he approaches this starting on Saturday and if he finds a combination that might work for the, the next two weeks after that. I'm uh, I, I'm laughing at Burned trying to play gotcha on me because oh. everybody said, or Burn said, you said too, Mike, and I'll give you my counter to it, about needing more wing depth. Yes. Burn says this proved that we need more wing depth. I would 100% thoroughly disagree. Because you got a goal from a forward playing on the wing in Dwyer. You showed at the end of the game, well, you got a goal from another winger in Caleb Wiley, who's a left back. Brooks Lennon played on the wing. 
And, and here's the bonus kicker of why I think, you know, one, you're missing Tiago Almada and Marcelino Moreno as a start. And then you got Araujo hurt. So you're taking starters out. So anybody's depth is going to be tested. Number one, yeah. that's not unique to Atlanta United, but two, there's been a change to the MLS roster rules and it went very under the radar, very under the radar, which is not a surprise. The <laughs> short-term call-ups from your affiliate, which would be Atlanta United too, in this case, it's not tied to having a minimum number of players available anymore. You can, call guys up for a short-term deal. Now, they have to be signed to that team, so you can't bring up an academy player. But you could call up Aiden McFadden. You could call up Darwin Mateus if you have the international slot to put him in, in that case. McFadden doesn't need one. But you have that as additional depth on the wing. So I I know where you're trying to go, but I actually (laughs) think you showed by getting two goals – from wingers that were depth pieces, you've got good depth. And I would not be shocked if Aiden McFadden, who was with the team for most of the preseason, wouldn't be shocked at all if he's part of one of these games that will be missed by Luis Araujo. And honestly, if you've got the international slot, I wouldn't be surprised if Darwin Mateus is part of it either. Yep. Yeah. I think Eric Centeno might be in that mix as well, perhaps. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's another one. And he's on. He's a first-team roster guy that we think, even though it wasn't announced like the others were, I think he might be loaned to the twos for the season. But maybe he's a back-and-forth guy for the first part of the could year. Could be. Might find out more on your Twitch broadcast in a little bit. Absolutely. He did not uh, play on the weekend. Right. But that might have been on purpose. You know, it, yeah. they might have been holding him out of that Tormenta thing. Maybe he was guy 21. Case, right. Or just in case, like, again, Moreno's first day of training was Saturday, we were told. Yeah. Like, what if Moreno didn't pass his fitness test? Yeah. What if Lennon didn't pass his fitness test? So, I mean, I think they were being pretty cerebral uh, when it came to Centeno. Here's okay. the thing, that, you know, again, with wing depth. When, when I made that comment, okay. I was assuming that, Marcelino Moreno and Brooks Lennon would be out well into the month of March. True, yeah. We got a very pleasant surprise on Sunday when we saw that both would be able to play. Yeah. But, I mean, again, and I'm not trying to get defensive here. No, but, no, mean, you're right. Just, just count it. Like, if you don't have Moreno and you don't have Lennon and you don't have Almada uh, and you don't have Mulraney and Dom's not going to play for this team – He's gone, You're yeah. going to have problems with wing depth. <laughs> <laughs> and you when know? I said you had depth was talking about the roster as a whole. And right. Dom was still on it at that point. So look, right. it's all in the middle somewhere as any yeah. conversation about this game is, but you got two goals from makeshift wingers on the weekend. That's pretty good. I, I had a feeling if remember last Friday, I predicted that Ronald Hernandez would score the first goal of the year for Atlanta United. I really had a feeling Oh, did I goal. get it right? I think I did. You did. Didn't yeah, I you, said our yeah. you said yeah. Yeah, right. but I, I, I just, got that right. I really thought it was going to come from a wing. And what I actually thought was that it could be like a spilled rebound or deflection or some kind of broken play with Hernandez crashing it, kind of similar to the way he scored at Cincinnati last right. year. Yeah. Um, so I, I had a feeling that, it, it, you know, that right wing, it might have been that, turned out to be Aruju instead of Hernandez. Uh, but, uh, yes, I mean, all three goals came from wingers and, um, again, I I think this is, this is the way that Carlos kind of set this team up two years ago. He wanted to have a lot of speed down the flanks for whatever reason, it just did not fully click and come together. I think it would have suited the Heinz a system pretty well if, um, you know, some of the other issues with Heinz a did not exist. And it was just all about the soccer and everyone was happy and, and working. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the way that they assembled this team with all that speed could have worked with a team that would play touchline to touchline as Heinze wanted it to, to be. Now you've got it. Uh, and now you've got it with a team that, that seems to be cohesive and, and happy. So this will not, I mean, really, if you think about it, if our is only out for four weeks, I think the potential is absolutely there for Luis Araujo to have double-digit goals this year. I think there is absolutely the potential for Tiago Amada to have double-digit goals this year, or maybe double-digit assists, or maybe both. 
I think there's absolutely the potential for Marcelino Moreno to have double-digit goals or double-digit assists, depending on how many matches they play. Uh, and by the way, I think you're going to see Ronald Hernandez and Andrew Goodman score goals this year. I really do. I, I mean, it, it's not going to be double digits, but I wouldn't be shocked if Ronald Hernandez had three or four goals this year. If Andrew Goodman had three or four goals this year, it wouldn't shock me at all. You mentioned Andrew Goodman. Let me let me uh, bring him to the uh, to the table here this morning and how you mentioned activity on the wings. Goodman clamped down on Johnny Russell, and Johnny Russell tried to to shoulder tackle him at one point as to the level of frustration, I think, in trying to handle Andrew Gutman. Solid first outing for him out there on the left. Oh, yeah. No, I, I thought he was absolutely terrific. Um, you know, and again, I, I want to be careful how I say this because it, I don't want it to sound disrespectful in any way to George Bellow, but I just – I really believe that – Atlanta United is not going to lose a step at left back this year. And in fact, that they could even get maybe a little better at left back. Uh, Koopman is such a nice player. And I don't know how I missed it last year when he was with Red Bulls. Um, you know, everyone talked about what a great year he was having with Red Bulls last year. I just don't like watching Red Bulls. <laughs> so maybe I didn't, I didn't notice it a lot. But uh, now he, he's been phenomenal. You want to keep him healthy, obviously. Uh, because you do, I think you do worry a little bit about the cover at left back right now, just a bit. Um, but no, I don't, that's, I don't worry about left back. Why not? Mikey Ambrose and Caleb Wiley. I got no worries. Yeah. Uh, well, it, Caleb Wiley's still 17 and no worries. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I like, I'm, I'm high on Caleb and, and I've, I've always felt like Mikey is a guy that he's a boy scout. You need him. He can step in. You're good. Fair enough. He's not the same level, and and I think that's where, when I talk about depth, I'm not expecting the same level in a replacement, and I think maybe sometimes that gets thrown into the conversation. I, I think you have to understand it's going to be a drop-off. Um, Mikey's not Andrew Gutman. Mikey would be starting in the league if he was. I think Mikey is a very capable reserve. And the good thing about him is he can play different positions too. So you can get a little bit of a bonus action with him because he's a smart guy. And I think Caleb, you know, I, and I've changed this over the preseason because before we started, when he was signed, I was right there with you, Mike. I thought it would be 25 games for Caleb with the twos, maybe a handful of bench appearances with the first team. I think he is trusted in whatever role he's needed for now. I think he's earned that in the preseason. I think Pineda loves him, and I think Pineda trusts him. And I would say, yeah, because of that growth, you're you're pretty good for depth at left back because of, yeah. of Wiley's development. Yeah, no, uh, fair enough. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, just keep him healthy. But uh, uh, off to, Goodman was off to a really, really good start on Sunday. Very yeah. pleased with him. R Ricky with a good point. We might have to call Mikey the scout master now because uh, he's having a baby boy. That's true. That, I, that I, came out yesterday. That was a gender cool. reveal. Gender yeah. reveal yesterday. Yeah, very, very cool. Mike, Mikey's one of the good ones. I'm, I'm happy that he's here. I'm happy he's part of this group. Um, we have questions about Atlanta and Charlotte and what the rivalry is going to be called. Are we really pushing Royal Rumble pretty hard, Mike? Uh, I think Vince McMahon's copyright attorneys might have something to say right. about that. Well, we know I somebody. Like, who knows I don't know. Him. I don't know. We got somebody in the mix who knows him. Maybe, maybe Kevin Patrick can have a conversation with him. Yeah, could be. Uh, guys, hold on one second. I'll be right back with you. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Mike will be back. Um, we will figure that out as we go. I don't think anything is really stuck yet. Um, I do want to touch on this really quick, and I hate that we even have to, but I'm going to, and and sorry. Um. There were some really shockingly uh, disrespectful and um, awful responses to uh, Jessica Charman's tweet yesterday about Luis Araujo's injury, which she didn't say anything that wasn't factually correct. She didn't say anything that implied anything. Anybody who took implication of it was bringing their own stuff into it. She said the exact same things that I said the week before talking about Gadi Kenda having an injury and being you know, having surgery with uh, Vunjevic not being available yet due to visa issues. Her audience, her job, the, her employers 
she's informing Charlotte FC fans about what's going on with upcoming opponents. That's it. I was a little a little embarrassed at some of the people who decided to try to go at her and question her integrity, which I thought was where I got really upset about it. Um, I've said it before to you, you guys, and I will never shy away from saying it. We are humans. We are people. Behind our Twitter account, behind, I mean, you see me here, but behind our microphones on a podcast, we're human beings and we have jobs to do. You know, Jess is a commentator for Charlotte FC. I'm a commentator for Atlanta United. I'm going to talk about things that affect Atlanta matches. She's going to talk about things that affect Charlotte matches. Personal attacks for doing our jobs is not needed, and it's sad to see. Um, I know you said something about this online, Mike, if, if you're back with us. Are you talking about Jess? Yes. I, I, I wanted would, to uh, clarify that that I, was I, sad to see people going at her and questioning I, integrity. I, I, uh, uh. Uh, I, I, yeah, that really bothered me. Mm-hmm. We know Jess. She's reporting a fact. She We've prefaced it, it by she's prefaced it by saying that no one wants to see anyone get hurt. Yep. Um, I was very disappointed to see the reaction and then the backpedaling by people who were trying to make that a big deal, saying, "Oh, well, I was just tweeting one word." No, that uh, that's that's not what you were doing. And I was very disappointed to see that. Um, there were personal Jess had attacks absolutely that I had a problem with. There were yeah, personal yeah. attacks with it. That yeah, and, and this whole, like, look, guys, let's stop with the whole, you know, we got to make Atlanta and Charlotte a mean-spirited thing. Uh, and let's stop with the whole, well, she works for Charlotte, and she's their color commentator, and therefore this represents the position of the team. That's not correct either. Oh, that's, that's not, not correct either. So I was really, really disappointed. Really disappointed by that. We're going to have Jess and Will on stoppage time in a couple of weeks. I'm not even going to take a moment to address this on that stoppage no. time show. But the fact of the matter is, that is a break for Charlotte. It 100% is. They don't have to play against Atlanta United's arguably maybe yep. best well, player, if, if, if not one of their top three players. That is, yeah, I mean, Pilgrim's right. I'd be super relieved if I were a Charlotte mm-hmm. fan. And I didn't have to see him. So mm-hmm. I'm telling you, we just, we, it, and it's not just in this case, we just try yeah. so hard to jump all over everyone all the time for the littlest things that are not that big a deal. Yeah. Anyhow, back to the name of the Derby. Have we, like, what, what other proposals are on the floor for this? I don't know. I don't know if there's anything really concrete yet i mean there's been talk about sweet tea there's been talk about barbecue there's been all those kinds of things but say what do we do something with mint now uh no no i'm not claiming just because we have a secondary kit with and there's an art and isn't uh well something green Uh, we're forest forest yeah yeah we're forest no not not going down that road um i I don't know i've based it's 85. So if it's 75, that wouldn't work very well. That's with Nashville. That's true. Yeah, you still wouldn't get to Nashville if it's 74. 24. 24. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know what we call this thing. And nothing's really stuck yet. It's it's down to the fans to come up with something, Mike. Yeah, and look, it, it'll probably kind of evolve uh organically. Yeah. yeah. And um you, you know. Honestly, I'd like to see supporters on both sides collaborate on it, but I, I don't want it to also be something that's like officially declared, like, okay, we're officially sanctioning this as the <laughs> title of the rivalry. That That's not what we want. Uh, you know, it's just got to be something that evolves very, very organically. Nothing has stuck look, with me yet. Nothing is uh, stuck that I've heard. Nothing is, is coming to mind that I'm like, I, yeah, this know, is it. I, I like where Bart's going a little bit about barbecue. Uh, I know Cola Wars have been suggested because it's kind yeah. of a Coke versus Pepsi deal. Yeah. Like, yeah. there's a lot of kind of shared interests, cultural interests in the two cities. Um, so, and, and it goes beyond food and beverage. So, mm-hmm. we'll come up with something. And, and honestly, something that happens in the first match might end up dictating. Alan, um, Alan Franco. It, that is... 
That is true. We uh, although although I was uh, working on Charlotte yesterday. Apparently, their Alan Franco wants to be called Alan Franco. Uh, According okay. to their pronunciation guy. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go against that one. Um, okay. Yeah, he, he he's Alan Franco. He's All Ecuadorian. Right. All right. Well, I'm just reporting <laughs> what their pronunciation. Yeah, guys, right? yeah. We might need to get them some uh, uh, native Spanish speakers on the pronunciation guide because that's uh, yeah, it's Franco. It's got to be. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I don't know what the thing gets called. Um, something will stick. It's just like when we started throwing around the term 17s early on in 2017, that ended up sticking. You know, if it's something right. that we say in a broadcast or something that fans say and then we repeat or Doug repeats or Felipe repeats or Dirty South Soccer repeats, something will stick and gain traction. It just hasn't yet. Right. So I don't know what right. the thing's going to be called. Yeah. Uh, stoppage time today, 2 o'clock, Mike? 2 o'clock, yes. Uh, we'll look back at SKC. We'll look ahead to Colorado. I guess we'll recap your twos match. Uh, because No, no, wrap- that's actually been pushed back. So okay. that will be at 7 o'clock tonight. So are we are right at 2, not 2.05? We are right at 2 o'clock. Tonight. Right at 2. Okay. And look, we'll talk about week one in MLS. I think we learned yeah. a lot of things about a lot of teams that we just haven't had a lot of time to dig into yet. Um so uh, we'll, we'll get into that, too. Maybe we'll we'll try to sort through a little unofficial power ranking while we're at it. Oh, I like it. Thanks, Mike. We'll see it, yeah. too. And I will also make my case for why Tyler Wolf should have been team of the week. Oh, did he ever get those no, secondary assists? No, they did not give him that. Well, they gave him uh, one, but not the other. He got other. one. He didn't get the yeah. other. He should have got They both. didn't give him one on the Dwyer goal, and he should have had it. I'm really upset about that stuff. I'm, I'm going to go to Optus headquarters and, and stand outside and yell. Likewise. All right, see, hungry like the wolf. See you guys at two. <laughs> see you, Mike. Night. Thanks. All right, let's move over to the opponent this week and bring on friend of the show, Matt Pollard from Colorado. Hey, what's up, Matt? How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Morning. Doing good. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. No, thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's it's weird. We're getting a little bit of Atlanta weather. It is supposed to be in the 70s today in Colorado. So spring is officially here. We don't have traditional spring. Uh, we really just have a mix of winter into summer into spring schizophrenic weather. And then, of course, we could be set up for another So Classico on Saturday. So yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I don't like what I'm about to be walking into <laughs> in Colorado. Matt, we're going to get there tomorrow and i think the high tomorrow is like around 70 it's gonna be maybe just under that on friday and then saturday could be snow sleet all of the above and somewhere in the 20s to 40s yippee yeah so um you know i'd say definitely have gloves if your ears neck hands and feet are okay and then you're layering overall you'll be fine and worst case scenario i can bring my extra set of ski gear because we just the the entire press box and all of c38 uh last wednesday so a week ago now uh would have been dressed like they were going skiing at the dick luckily it's not gonna be that cold i don't think by rossignol (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't think it's going to be quite that bad, but it's not going to be pleasant. It could have an effect on the game. Um, I want to dig into the Rapids a little bit with you because I've been critical of their their approach coming into the season. I, I felt like last year they got more than maybe on paper they should have. And it's a credit to Robin Frazier. It's a credit to, to players that, that had great performances. But I felt like they really needed a number nine to take the next step. And these first three games of the season have reinforced that for me. What have you seen from the the first three from the Rapids? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly been disappointing. Obviously, the way that they went out in penalties against Comunicaciones was disappointing. Um, you know, we're counting. It's just been the one goal in the three games that they've played. Um, and obviously, that goal came with them up a man after the red card in the 15th, 16th minute, I think it was, after the VAR review in the second leg. But yeah, the, the attack's been really impotent. Um, they haven't had a whole lot of ideas in terms of once they get into the final third. They've done a decent job of getting the ball into good areas. Mark Anthony K had good energy coming back from the Canadian men's national team. Uh, Max Alves steps in, I think, the Thursday before. He gets there like two days before the friendly in Orlando, comes off the bench in the first leg of CCL, starts and scores the goal in the second leg, and then starts on Saturday. So that's a nice indication. You know, a uh, million dollars reportedly for the rapid spending is, you know, like 15 million for Ezekiel Barco. So, uh, so that's a good return so far on that. But 
Diego Rubio scored a couple goals in preseason, hasn't really done it yet. I don't know that Michael Barrios has been put in a position to be successful because the game state when he's been playing has always been the opponent putting numbers behind the ball, and they haven't done anything on set pieces. And so when none of those things that were working so well last season are happening early on, that's naturally going to gravitate the fan base, the Twitter community, people in the media, obviously, to ask the one big question that you had going into the offseason. Uh Torek Smith says that they're looking. The budget appears to be really tight. Uh, you know, I think this is a further indication for me, just further proof that I don't know that KSC is willing to shell out a whole bunch of money. I think if the Rapids are going to spend big on a number nine, that means that they need to sell big. And now we're looking around and thinking, you know, oh, is Ola Kamara really, you know, around? Should the Rapids have gone after Dom Dwyer, given what he did on the weekend? Um, and then, of course, everybody's kind of looking at, well, is Jossi Zardis going to start for Columbus next Saturday? Uh-huh. So I don't – so – your guess is as good as mine at this point, but right now it's it's another it's 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 bargain shopping within MLS. Well, and with KSE recently announcing that there is, uh, I believe it was a six million pound revenue discrepancy from year to year, you can guarantee that it will trickle over to their domestic ideas, whether it's the Mammoth or the Rapids or anything involving Colorado, where you say it's going to be bargain basement shopping. What is the DEFCON level right now? I mean, is it is it DEFCON? Are we at DEFCON 2 or leading toward DEFCON 1 when it comes to fan base and concern? Or are we still at the higher end of the scale at DEFCON 5 and 4 and still waiting here? I, I know it's kind of like a War Games reference with NORAD and everything, but I mean, where are where's the DEFCON level? Uh, I, I love War Games as a movie, John, so appreciate that. And maybe a little apropos given recent events going on mm. in the world. But um, if I was if I was to gauge on where the fan base is at, I would say most people in the fan base are leaning on two to three. I think there's a lot of people who are convinced now that this team isn't a playoff team. I'm at a DEFCON 5. I don't know that it's still early on in this season. Yeah. You know, Sporting Kansas City lost, Seattle lost, every single team that played in CCL lost, and the Rapids went for broke. They went all in on the CCL game. You combine with the fact that their regular season opener was against LAFC. They beat LAFC in that dramatic 5-3 game and decision day last year. That game, that result, that loss for LAFC eliminated them from the playoffs. Combined with the fact that you have Kellen Acosta against his former team, he's pretty salty when he plays his former clubs and everything it was a double revenge day for lafc the rapids is number one at the bank they usually don't play well at the bank they usually don't start well 30 minutes in as soon as lalas abubakar gives up that penalty on the handball and everything i was like okay there's only one way this game is going i'm disappointed i'm not fully surprised we are one penalty kick away from it being completely normal for the rapids and just looking for a 90 minute performance and a result on saturday yeah, I, I, I'm not at the stage that I, I think Colorado is not a playoff team. I think they are. I, I think the West has changed from last year. And we've talked about the East. I feel like there's three different groups of teams in the East. Um, there's like an elite tier of four. There's a tier of potential playoff teams of about five to six. And then there's teams that I don't think are going to be in that race at all at the bottom. The West feels more muddled outside of Seattle and Nashville, which I think are a step above everybody right now. And maybe Austin, although they kind of shocked us a little bit with such a huge win, uh, eh, maybe it's Houston. <laughs> it is. It is. So I, I'm with you. I'm not buying into Austin just yet. And Houston, although they're looking like they're going to get Herrera in the summer, so that should help them. I feel like two at the top, two at the bottom, and then everybody else is kind of muddled together. The L.A. teams could emerge from that group, and that pushes Colorado to competing for five six seven which i think they're capable of getting but they've got to find some goals here at some point no absolutely um i think you know me and my co-host rabbi mark goodman um we did our season preview this would have been what i think monday of last week before ccl started and we both had the rapids finishing fourth i realize that's probably a little bit optimistic i feel comfortable in saying this team like the the basement is them being a playoff team they have a good defensive structure they have really good depth they have a head coach who is calm in the face of chaos and needing to solve problems they play really good at home they have a distinct home field advantage they are organized tactically and other than at LAFC and then maybe at Seattle, usually don't beat themselves. That is good enough for you to beat the FC Dallas's of the world, the FC Cincinnati's of the world. I kind of want to put DC United in that, but I guess TBD TBD on that as well. That's good enough for you to beat the teams that you're supposed to and then get some results against the teams that are in your tier and then maybe get an upset win with Seattle coming on short rest to Colorado. That should be good enough to be like, 
five or sixth in the Western Conference. But yeah, your, your point's valid. You know, I think LAFC is kind of the perfect marker of that. Steve Chirondolo is an unknown for me in MLS. I had no idea what we were going to get out of Carlos Vela. Uh, probably should amend my golden boot and uh, MVP prediction in the season based on what he did. You know, if, if, that's, if that's what LAFC is from what we saw on Saturday, they could finish second in the Western Conference. But I still think there's a possibility, you know, Carlos Vela, if he leaves in the summer, since his contract is up in the summer, if Steve Chirondolo has some issues maybe Kellen Acosta's you know uh focused on national team stuff or something else we'll see whether or not Eddie Segura comes back from his injury from last season I'm pretty sure that was an ACL tear that he had in the final two months of the regular season they could finish eighth and be comfortably outside the playoffs so yeah. LAFC is kind of the str- the extreme in terms of where their upper bar their their error bars are but yeah Colorado's certainly in there and missing the playoffs is plausible so now that we know that Carlos Vela is on track for 102 goals this season uh, <laughs> in Major League Soccer, who, if Cassie does not invest to the level that you would like for them to, to bring in a number nine, who on the roster currently or is within reach at the table can get you 10% of that? Who can be a 10%er for you? And if it's multiple guys, that's great for Colorado to get to that five, six, seven. Who can be that 10 percenter if, if Vela is going to score 102? Who can get you 10? And can it be more than one guy? Uh, can it be more than one guy? Plausibly. Will it be? I'm not so sure. I think the obvious low hanging fruit of somebody who didn't do it last year, who's proven that they can do it would be Diego Rubio. He was injured to start the season. He was injured through the middle of the season and then the uh, they kind of played a little bit differently with how they were doing with kind of like a false nine and Michael Barrios up there. Barrios had eight goals, five assists, if I'm remembering correctly. That's yeah. kind of his high water mark. You know, he didn't score. I think he had 17 goal contributions one year with Dallas. He's already turned 30. That's going to be the most that you're going to get out of him. I would take eight and five right now from Michael Barrios. Uh, but I think Diego Rubio is certainly there. You know, he proved that he could do it, albeit with Kai Kamara and being more as a secondary striker in 2019 uh, with the Colorado Rapids. So, you know, could he get to 10 goals? Yes, but I think it's going to have to be him starting the entire season. I think other areas where you look to get extra production, Andre Shinyashiki, who scored a bunch of goals at DU and the Rapids drafted him, moved up to get him fifth overall. Um, he's been mostly played as a midfielder. He originally, he's a really good presser. And then he's really good in terms of like hold up play. And he kind of started, Robin Frazier was like, we need some help in midfield. He could do that in midfield. And so he's kind of been moved there. So maybe he backs up Diego Rubio and gets six or seven goals, which is something he hasn't reached since 2019 when he won rookie of the year, but kind of internally with the rest of the media, we've kind of been thinking this team's DP striker is set pieces. And obviously, as I went back to earlier, three games so far, no goals scored and then really kind of a a lack of impetus of putting yourself in those situations to either create crosses to create goals or to create where the opponent has to foul you or give up a corner so I guess if if I'm answering you directly John I think the I think the the DP striker for the Colorado Rapids is goalkeeper and special teams coach uh Chris Sharpie who specifically works on set plays on both sides of the ball and everything and works regularly with Drak Price on that and it does that a meticulous level of detail that Rob Robin Frazier has said multiple times, nobody else he's seen in MLS. That's going to be critical to make up that gap because there is a talent gap, I think, in the attack. But I do like the one big addition in the attack this year in Max. I, I like what I've seen from him. He could, I don't know if he's a double digit goal scorer, but I'm not ruling it out. He's the one that I do really wonder where he's going to get played. Is he going to play as a 10? Is he going to play as kind of a false nine? How is that going to look? Is it going to be 5-3-2 or 3-5-2? How do things shift with there? And what do you think of Max so far? I think Max has been great, obviously, coming in and working his way into fitness relatively quickly. Getting the goal was fantastic and something that he did. I don't know if you guys uh, remember the actual play, but he kind of works into a little bit of tight spaces, um, was done really well. And obviously, and I would assume the first ever snow game that he had ever played in coming from Brazil. So uh, Max has been spectacular. I think it's a really good question, Jason, as to whether or not he's in a midfielder. 
uh, role. I think the, the Rapids most recently have been in the 3-5-2 empty bucket and the way that they refer to it internally as a 6 and 2 eights. Normally that's been Jack yeah. Price in the destroyer Regista role and then it's used to been last year. It would have been Kellen Acosta and Mark Anthony K towards the end of the season. Those roles for me are a little bit more defined in terms of who's the more 10-ish 8 and who's the more 6 is 8. I think sure. if you have Max in there with Mark Anthony K and K having a little bit more of a uh, – uh, further back in the field role with the Canadian national team, there'll be some give and take there. I also think it's a valid question when Austin trustee leaves in July for Arsenal. And then this whole formation, the idea for Robin Frazier was we have three really good center backs. We want to get them on the field. Does Robin Frazier go back to his more normal four, three, three, and then does that offer an opportunity for Max to go out on the wing? If you go back and look at his highlights from his time in Brazil, often as a midfielder, when the team's in transition, he'll flare out all, the way to the flank and then come inside and so is that an opportunity for him especially since we still don't know when Brian Galvan will be coming back from his ACL injury so it's a good question so far he's been in a central midfield role and it's been effective I'd like to see if that can be effective for 90 minutes rather than just in 30 minute stretches yeah Matt let me ask about Robin Frazier a little bit and I know that a lot of folks don't get to see him on the touchline, they're they're not watching every Colorado Rapids game. They're not at practices, and they just catch highlights, and they'll see standings and things like that. What has it been like for you to see Robin Frazier work within the framework given to him financially by KSE to do what he did last year and try to replicate that in this year? What, what's it been like to see Robin Frazier work with what he has in front of him? I feel very comfortable in saying other than behind Gary Smith, who obviously was the head coach for the Rapids in 2010, who agreed the greatest thing that the Rapids have ever done. He is the best head coach in the history of the Colorado Rapids. He is so meticulous in his detail. There's a calm, almost uh, presence about him in a very, um, I don't know, maybe this is a weird analogy, again, given recent events, but kind of in a in a leadership, like there's chaos going around and there's questions about what the answer and is, you know, when I was asking him, uh, you know, maybe this time last year, you know, Sam Bynes is going to be going to the Gold Cup. And, you know, what are you thinking about that? It's like, oh, you know, we're looking at a couple solutions. We've got a couple ideas internally. And then I remember at training, you know, he had, uh, you know, he had started playing Austin Trusty out there. And it's like the, yeah, he's not really perfect, but he can do a couple of really good things. And he doesn't really, he, he doesn't, uh, ask what he should do. He doesn't, at, he asks questions about what he needs to do, but says, okay, I can do it. And so there was just kind of, there's a calm presence about him that I think is night and day from the previous manager that you had um, with, uh, you know, like Robin Frazier's never coming out and saying, we're a, you know, we're a bottom team fighting at the bottom with a bottom group yeah, of players or anything. Uh, you know, he's like the, you know, we need to come up with some solutions. I need to coach them better. And then, you know, he's, uh, you know, I guess the the quote that comes to me is he has a very, uh, Roosevelt, like do what you can with what you have, where you are. Um, and there's no real panic in his mind. He has ideas for solutions um, and he never really gets too high or too low. And I think that served as a good uh, thermostat for the Colorado Rapids last season. And obviously given the state of the club right now, um, it's going to serve him well in chaos. So it's early in the season. And this is the last one for me, Matt, like it, we're kind of figuring things out on the fly. There's injuries happening. Atlanta's lost Luis Adarushu for about four weeks. Uh, don't know where Marcelino Moreno is going to be in terms of his fitness coming back into it. So I'm sure Robin Frazier looking at what the Atlanta lineup could look like has a lot of questions. Colorado seems a little more stable in that regard and in continuity. And you get a full week to prepare. What do you think Colorado can do well to cause Atlanta problems? Um, I don't think that the the pressing in the second half against LAFC was not particularly good. And we've seen it. We saw at times in the CCL game that wasn't necessarily there. I don't know if that was a fitness issue. People kind of tend to forget. It's like, oh, you know, Rapids playing at altitude and everything. You know, they were in Arizona for a month to prepare for that. And then Guatemala City is actually almost close to, um, you know, a uh, uh, I think it's 4,900 feet of elevation. So if anything, the Rapids were a non-altitude condition team playing in altitude. So I'd like to see the fitness levels a little bit better. I'd like to see the pressing a little bit better. And then especially given what Carlos Vela did in transition, where Joseph Martinez is going to play in the half spaces and between the lines and everything, can can they just manage their gap control and everything much better? Lal Sabuakar had two bad plays on that, and it led to two goals from the run of play on Saturday. So I think focusing on that a little bit more and, you know, 
Vela did start in a central role in the 4-3-3 for LAFC. So maybe going back and looking at that film, there's going to be, there's enough similarity to where it's the, oh, let's practice like what we didn't do against Vela is going to be similar to what Joseph is going to do. I think will serve them a little bit better. And then just, you know, again, I, um, they didn't create enough set pieces and they didn't do enough on them. So I'm not sure if that's an indication of rust. Uh, the Rapids don't historically score a lot of set piece goals early on in the season. So maybe there's just a little bit of sharpness that they're working on generally within their game, but included on set pieces. But if they can press better, do it for 90 minutes, individually manage the gaps and the spacing around Joseph a little bit better, and then have a little bit more venom on set pieces. I think that's a massive step forward for this club. Last question for me has nothing to do with the, the match this weekend for the 17s and for uh, Jason and Mike and anybody else that's coming out to Denver, uh, a restaurant that they have to go to that personifies Denver that they can get into because we know how weekends are with reservations and things. Mm-hmm. And it's always that must, that must go to place that you can't get into. How about a must go to place that you can get into that would personify Denver for everybody making the trip? It would personify Denver for everybody making the trip. Well, uh, John, if I'm if I'm choosing the mean option, and I suggested this to Kellen Acosta, and the rest of the media roasted me for it. Um, if you guys are old school fans of South Park, Casa Bonita has officially <laughs> reopened. I did. I, the, I'm not going to say that the food is good. I'm just going to say that it's an experience. Um, but if I were to pick something that's a little bit better of an option, I think obviously if you wanted something that's a little bit more soccery, I'm going to assume um, that there's been an invite extended from C38 to meet at the uh, Celtic downtown. If you want another soccer bar, the Bulldogs going to have soccer games on earlier. So I'm pretty sure there's, I think there's a few games in on Saturday. I feel like everybody and their mother is playing at 4 p.m. Mountain time on Saturday. But if you want uh, soccer early on in the morning, I'd say the bulldog um, right off of stout street and then if you want something that i think is a good option for colorado mexican food i prefer mexico city that's the name of the restaurant we're not going to usa mexico at the azteca (laughs) um the deep fried tacos are fantastic and and then any one of the combo plates where you can get green chili um you know would be typical colorado mexican so those are the kind of depends on what you're doing for game day and everything casa bonita is a little bit out of a drive out of the way if there's snow on six i wouldn't necessarily recommend it but if you're staying in and around downtown I'd say probably Premier League at the Bulldog, uh, lunch at Mexico City, and then head over to the Celtic to hang out with C38. Excellent. Matt, thanks for taking some time for us. I appreciate it. Uh, Big help on getting ready for this game with Colorado. And uh, see you on Saturday. Yeah, see you on Saturday. Maybe I'll bundled up. (laughs) Yeah, probably. I'm going to have to make some room for some extra warm weather gear in my bag. (laughs) Great. (sighs) Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Thanks, gents. Be good. We'll see Matt uh, on Saturday out in Denver. Uh, Make sure you're following him, LWOS Matt Pollard, on social media. Uh, Matt's a a great resource for not just Colorado. He follows the league really closely. Uh, Rapids 96 podcast as well. Uh, But Last Word SC, a really good outlet. A lot of great writers there, but I've known Matt. For a long time covering the rapids and he knows them as well as anybody so uh and that mexico city restaurant sounds pretty good maybe i might have to make a stop there <laughs> my meals while i'm out there um all right we'll take some questions to finish up for about 10 plus minutes or so uh programming updates tonight seven o'clock on twitch.tv slash atl utd atlanta united two and the chattanooga red wolves preseason match uh, i'll be on the call for that i don't know if the red wolves will have numbers or a bunch of try lists uh so it could be a little bit of a talk show like it was last time against tormenta and we'll talk about what atlanta is doing um i'll try to take a few questions at halftime and, and stuff like that you can tweet them at me at long shoot during the game no high school action tonight uh some technical difficulties on the whitewater side so uh no game with pike county and whitewater hopefully we'll get a chance to see those teams at some point this season because two very good teams on the boys side for sure that i would like to see uh, and see how they end up doing especially pike I, i like seeing some of these uh outside the metro teams that are starting to rise up the charts in georgia high school soccer Uh, We're getting closer and closer. Um, Finals will be early May, first week of May in Macon and at McEachern. Um, Not sure what all the broadcast plans are going to be for that. They've changed the way they format it. It's over a longer period of time, so it's a completely different setup. But we'll keep you posted on all of that. Uh, Saturday, while I'm out in Colorado, 
John will have a twos preseason match um, on twitch.tv slash ATL UTD. So be on the lookout. You don't have to do the slash every time, John. You, you can you can skip them. It's, okay. Please do. Um, what's Who do you have on Saturday? Who's the opponent? Uh, Greenville, 1 o'clock. Greenville Triumph, 1 o'clock. So you can watch that and then get ready for Atlanta United in Colorado afterwards on 92.9 The Game. And on Valley Sports Southeast, I believe it's on Southeast this time. If it's, if it's on Valley Sports South, that's okay. And Kevin and Mo and Jillian will be in Colorado for that. So we'll see them out there. Um, all right. Questions. Vamos Vader wants to know who gets our first red card this season. Hmm. I am going to put my uh, marker on Osvaldo Alonso. Uh, yeah. The tackle that he laid in on Sunday was woo. Hmm. Um, He's going to do one of those and, and, and get caught and get a red. Uh, Alan Franco would be my second choice. Yeah, I was going to say Franco and then Franco Ibarra would have been my one and two. I don't know when Franco Ibarra is back, so that's why I think Ozzy gets it. Um, I don't think Ibarra is as reckless. I think he's very physical, but I don't think he's as reckless. I think Franco, Alan Franco can get a little reckless, and Ozzy uh, is known for being reckless at times. So I will go Ozzy on a mistimed tackle. Okay. Uh, it's on Bally Sports Southeast. Thank you, Ricky. I couldn't remember which one off the top of my head. Uh, but that'll be the first Bally's game of the weekend. Okay, more questions. We will take them. Um, other stuff that is popping off this morning. The Hector Herrera conversation is being forwarded by Fabrizio Romano that he could sign his deal today with Houston. He could sign it uh, in the next couple of days. But he will be a member of the Houston Dynamo, and he will join in the summer. That is a big addition. For the Dynamo, they need to make that kind of a statement. I think it's a, a very important one and curious to see what that does for the team in the market. They need these kinds of moves that I think get you attention. They, they, they need a move that's going to help you on the field, but also that gets you some buzz in the market. It's what they've struggled with. Um, we've had Glenn Davis on the show, talked to Glenn over the years and, I know it drives Glenn crazy that they haven't been able to fully activate the Houston market. And I think Hector Herrera will be a player who can help do that for sure. And yeah, he'll be a player that is not liked around the league as Niles says, um, and you're dead on. I mean, and that's good. I don't have a problem with heels, whether they're on your team or on another team. Um, you need personalities and not all of them are going to be sunshine and flowers. You need some guys that'll get under your skin. You need some guys that, that get emotion flowing. Emotion is what this game is founded on. I think at times, maybe in this country, we try to stamp it all down and everything's vanilla and it's, you know, don't want to upset anybody too much. You know, you get a yellow card. That's bad. It's bad. It's really bad. No, <laughs> it's okay. We don't want emotion throwing things at buses like we get in some countries. True. We don't want throwing things on the field like we get in some countries and horrible chants and things like that. But yeah, it's okay to not like a team a little bit and not like some players on the team and boo them. That's completely cool. It's a good thing. Uh, Ricky, we haven't talked about it today because we, we mentioned it before the signing for Toronto. We mentioned it when the rumors first came up with Crescito. Uh, we mentioned it again last week when it started pushing forward even more. It looks like it's going to get done. Friend of Lorenzo Insigne, former Italian national team player, 35 years old as a defender at Genoa. Genoa is now talking about, hey, he received a really important offer. Don't know if we're going to be able to keep him. He would actually be joining Toronto really quickly. Um, I don't know if 35-year-old defenders uh, at this point in their career are really the moves that make big differences. I tend to think they don't. Um, it will be good for Lorenzo Insigne when he shows up in the summer to have a familiar face. Yes. But if that's why they're making the signing, mm, I don't know. Um, I think the bigger thing for Toronto is going to be big picture. How do you Schaffelberg, uh, Marshall Ruti, anybody else that's going to be converted to play outside back, how they handle it. Uh, goal they gave up was bad to Dallas. It was on the, the, the coverage out wide. Let's see if that continues to improve. It got better as the day went on. That was a good point for them on the road in Dallas. I think Dallas is a potential playoff team. But you're asking two young wingers to become outside backs on the fly. And we will see what happens there. Um, okay. Let's keep going here. Sam Williamson says, do you think Heinemann will play 
more twos games than first team as he's coming back from the injury. I, I do think he'll get some time with the twos once he gets to that stage. Um, if his timeline was different, maybe he would have got games in preseason as that kind of ramp up. Right now, I think he'll get some time with the twos. Uh, we've seen them do that over the years. I know Franco Escobar coming back from injury, played like 45 with the twos. Um, oh, there's at least one last year. It happens. You know, Heinemann will get some game action for the twos. I don't think much. I mean, I think it's probably 45 minutes, one, two, three times at the most. And then he'll be back into the mix with the first team. But yeah, I think it'll be good to get him some game time for Atlanta United too, for sure. Uh, let's see what else we got. Houston's key players burned wants to know, uh, who will Herrera be surrounded with Darwin Quintero, who is still dangerous. Um, but older, how much does he have? He could use the help too. So I I think that is a big help. Um, I do like on paper, the signing they made, uh, the Paraguayan forward, um, Sebastian Ferreira he's making a fairly big jump in level. I think the Paraguayan league to MLS is far more substantial than Argentina or Brazil to MLS. So he's got to get, I think just accustomed to the way the game is played here. It's a little bit different style too, but he could really benefit from having another player around him. Uh, Memo Rodriguez, who I've always liked. I think Memo is a, a very good, very, very good player. And I want to see how he gets used under Paulo Nagamura. Matias Vera, good holding midfielder. I think that'll be somebody that Herrera will play closely with. If not him, it'll be Darwin Serin, who I like as well. Honduran center, central mid, but he's getting a little bit older. So maybe he kind of rotates in a bit. Fafa Pico is there. Uh, back line, Daniel Stairs and Tim Parker as your center backs, not bad. Steve Clark as your goalkeeper, not bad. Griffin Dorsey and Adam Lundqvist were your starters on the outside backs. Um, eh. Corey Baird is there as well. He didn't play well at all in this one. Um, I still don't really know where Corey Baird fits as a player. I don't know if he's a nine. I don't know if he's a second forward. I don't know if he's a winger. Uh, very energetic, a lot of movement, good pace. I don't know his position in a, in a top team yet. I'm just not sure where he fits. Uh, Quintero came off the bench. Pasher is there, uh, young Canadian. Derek Jones, who I've always thought would bust through and get time, but just hasn't anywhere he's been. Uh, Zarek Valentin is there as an outside back. He played the second 45 in the match on the weekend. And young uh, designated player center back, Teenage Hadibi, um, who played in the AFCON tournament. He is there. He did not play on the weekend. I think he kind of got a little bit of a break after AFCON, and he'll ramp back up here quickly. So it's not a bad roster. It's honestly not a bad roster. Ferreira's got to get accustomed to the league. You got to figure out how to use Cantero. You got to figure out how to use Baird. And I think you got to really position Memo Rodriguez to be a, a real creator with this group. And is it two up top with Pico and Ferreira? Is it one with Pico coming off the wing? Is Baird coming off the wing in a 4-3-3 or 4-5-1? There's questions for Nagamura, but I don't think Herrera is walking into a team that doesn't have talent. Yeah, Glenn Davis on the broadcast on the weekend was catching up with owner Ted Siegel and flat out asked him about reinforcements. And Siegel said, said stay tuned, and we're getting this information now. And after all the the signing came out and the information on the signing came out, Glenn Davis said biggest star to ever sign for the club. If it goes down bar none. And he's saying that, you know, yeah. this is, it's a watershed moment for Houston. And, you know, we've talked about it on the show independently. We've talked about it when we've had Glenn on that they need to have that hook because it really could be something special in Houston. And I'm hoping for the fans of Houston and for that region that Herrera can be that hook to draw folks in for a, a product that Ted Siegel is investing in and hoping to turn it into a success. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if this can be a spark to that. I mean, I think Herrera is the biggest star the Dynamo have had since Dwayne De Rosario and Brian Ching who were stars with the Houston Dynamo, um, and they were winning. So the winning was moving the needle in Houston when they first arrived. 
I don't think they've moved the needle really since that era of the team. Even the 11, 12 teams that made it to MLS Cup, I think were more defensive, um, didn't have as much star power. Ching's star was waning at that point. De Rosario had moved on. Herrera can be a star and be in a Houston Dynamo kit all over town and be a big deal. So uh, we will see once he arrives this summer. I, I think it's a good signing. Uh, Vader asks, uh, Joseph still doesn't look 100%. Do we ever get pre-injury Joseph? Question mark. Or overreaction from first game back? I'm going with the latter. I don't know what he needed to do to show that he was 100%. Um, you can only do what the game really fits. And look, Joseph isn't going to be a guy. You're not asking him to do what Araujo did in the press, for example. You're asking Joseph to kind of hang back just a little bit. Um, I don't want him running around like, uh, like, you know, just chasing, chasing, chasing. Adarujo has got the motor to do that. Wolf has got the motor to do that. Joseph is, was never that guy. And I don't think anything changed with the injury in possession. You didn't have a lot of it. Uh, but when you did, he dropped into the midfield and did what we have seen Joseph do since 2019, uh, even a little bit at the end of 2018, but more since 2019. Um, nothing really different for me there. Um, I didn't notice any issues. I honestly didn't. There wasn't anything that made me feel like he wasn't 100%. He wasn't super involved because the team didn't have the possession advantage. So they were playing more in transition. And Joseph impacted the game really well with two assists. So I will I will take what he gave you. Um, as he gets older, he's going to evolve into a different player, injury or no injury. And I think that's something that has to be understood. And I think he's evolving into a, a, a really interesting player with getting on the ball more in deeper positions and he picks a good pass you know last year he passed at 88 89 percent i mean uh, stats don't tell you everything pep guardiola will yell at me if I, I cite a stat but he doesn't give the ball away easily and he creates some chances off of these things joseph was after the kind of elite tier of shot creating actions that you got from Araujo, that you got from Barco, that you got from Moreno last year, I mean, top 20 in the league kind of shot creating action numbers. Joseph was really next. And for a number nine, he had actually pretty high numbers in that regard because he's not just creating for himself. He's creating for others, too. So I think his game just evolves. Um, I think it's an overreaction to say that he doesn't look 100%. I do. I, I think he was fine. Um, I think his game's going to be different over time, but I think this game specifically was just a game that, you know, you didn't get him a ton of touches in spots because that's what it was. Um, okay, more questions as we start to wrap up. Um, Burns says Toronto turning really good young wingers into bad fullbacks is a choice, not Bob Bradley's finest hour. Well, he doesn't have any fullbacks, so he, he doesn't have much of a choice at the moment. Um, that's got to get resolved. Schaffelberg in that role, I get it more because he hasn't been looked at consistently as a starter in this league as a left winger. I would beg to differ. He's a player that I have mentioned multiple times um he's a player that i have said that if he was available i would love to see him in atlanta he's a player that i've told people can be more than he's been um he is very left-footed which hey if you're a lefty you can get away with that if you're a righty now you got to have a, a left foot that's decent if you're a lefty you're kind of unique enough on the pitch that you can get away with it but he's got to be a little more well-rounded. If he's not going to be a starting winger, maybe he is a starting left back. Maybe he can be that. I get that one more. Marshall Rudy, though, the narrative coming out of Toronto is that they think he can be an a, they think they've thrown around world-class, probably an overstatement, um, but a top right back or wing back, depending on how you want to play it. Okay, I think he could be a top winger too. Um, but everybody's high on him as a right back. Maybe it works out in the long term. I don't know. I'm more skeptical of that one. Schaffelberg, it feels like, well, you're, you've got Kamar Lawrence in limbo and 
I don't know what he's still on the roster from my understanding, but he's not there. He's not playing. I have no idea what's going on. You got to play somebody over there. If Schaffelberg's not going to be a player on the wing, then he's got to be a player in the back. And there you go. A little bit of necessity. The Marshall Rudy one burned is the one that I got questions about. I'm, it's just weird to me when everybody comes out with the same narrative about Marshall Rudy's going to be a top right back. That's where he played when he was training with Liverpool in, in the off season and with their reserves. And he played as a right back and that's what he's going to be. Okay. Let's see it. I'm not as bought in on that one. I'm just not um, a lot of back and forth about Joseph and, and how he looked to people on the weekend. Um, I, I'm, Again, I'm, I think it's an overreaction early on. Let's see when you have 60% of the ball and you're trying to feed him and create those opportunities, not in transition, but when the opponent's sitting back a little bit more, as we could see this weekend, how does he look in that sprint to get in between in the channel to, as, as Matt was talking about, kind of find those half spaces and in turn and go, how can he be in, in those kinds of spots? Um, we'll just have to see. We'll, we'll, we'll just have to see where that goes. Um, Niall points out that Joseph dragged sporting Kansas city defenders near him, able to provide space. That, that's different. He's always going to have that. Um, or at least for a long time, he's going to have that because that positional gravity, the respect that people have for him, isn't going anywhere. And even last year, nowhere near hundred percent, he had 12 goals. So you have to respect him and you have to deal with him. And then he has to use that to better the team as he did with the back heel to Ara Uju pull guys and then play into space for others. If he can do that and he becomes a guy that gets you six to eight assists a year, creates a couple of chances a game. Araujo is going to create chances and take chances. Moreno is going to create chances and take chances. Almada is going to create chances and take chances. He's going to create a lot more than anybody else. Maybe take a, a couple fewer, but if that's your front four and they're all capable of creating for others and they're all capable of scoring goals, whoo, mm -hmm. that's all I'll say. Mm -hmm. uh, content mind, who will be the Weston McKinney for Herrera on each Western Conference team? Um, he'll find people to put his hands around their neck. Uh, I'm sure he won't, uh, he won't struggle to find those guys. Um, who will he get into into it with first out in the West? I mean, I don't know the schedule when he's going to arrive, but let's let's look really fast and see guys who jump out at me in this regard. Western Conference teams. Uh, I don't think he'll go after Chicharito or Vela. Uh, I'll leave them alone. Um, maybe Kellen Acosta. That could work. Uh, maybe that's it. Um, Nashville. You know, maybe Anibal Godoy. I don't know if he goes after Dax or Sean I was Davis. Say, Dax would have been my first choice. No, nah, I don't think he goes after Dax. Yeah. I, I think Godoy is a little more combative. Uh, Hector Herrera and Diego Chara will be a lot of fun. They, they might slap each other silly. Um, Herrera will probably go after Reynoso because he'll need to from Minnesota because Reynoso is their main creator. Uh, Dallas, maybe he doesn't like Palma calls hair. I don't know. Um, it's somebody from Dallas. He's got to do that with somebody from Dallas, right? Houston yeah. and, and Dallas hate each other. Um, hey, Philly, July 30th. Well, we we're talking Western conference. That was the question, but sure. Uh, Jose Martinez, uh, would be one that he would absolutely get into it with, uh, San Jose, maybe the whole team because of the way that they play. So, I mean, that's nothing new, uh, Kansas city. I could see him and Johnny Russell getting into it a bit. I don't know if he'll understand Russell with thick accent. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. Um, quite new, a few guys. For new Herrera. who is Seattle in September. 4th. New who's crazy and he'll yell at everybody. So yes, that'll happen for sure. Um, I did not hear on the, on the broadcast Vader about anything with Joseph looking over at trainers. I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary um, in watching it live. So none of that stuck with me. That's probably why I, I've got a little bit different feel on it as well. Um, let's see. Domer says the front office in Houston has a huge hole to dig themselves out of with the fans. They must repair that relationship. Front office still doesn't do much interaction with the SGs. All that has to happen too. And, uh, Glenn has, has told us from the Houston perspective, uh, kind of along those lines, they haven't been in the community enough, not as much on the SG specifically, but they haven't been out in the community enough. They haven't been, I think present enough in those situations. The Academy can be a big part of that too. And that is improving. They did make a really good hire there a year or two ago. 
and Paul Holliker coming over from San Jose. So the new ownership, I think, is a opportunity for a rebirth for the Houston Dynamo in a big way. And they have to understand these issues. They have to sign a player like Herrera to show intent. They have to then do the long term of being present in the relationship with the fan base, with the supporters groups, with community organizations, with local media, um, with local youth clubs, which seems to be uh, filled with a lot of friction, which happens in some markets. They've got to deal with all of that, but the Herrera move will give you that splash to then be able to follow up with the long-term relationship building. That's where I think it is. Um, let's see what else we got. Yes, burned it as, as I was saying about the Academy, which they are investing in and starting to get better at. Um, if they start to really produce homegrowns, they can be a powerhouse 150%. Um, I still memo Rodriguez is, is a guy, lo, a local guy. He can be a star for them. I think maybe Herrera can help facilitate that. That would be my double whammy. If I'm really publicizing this team is, Hey, we've got a hallmark of the L tree, you know, national team. And he's accomplished. He's got a La Liga medal to his name. And yes, we have memo Rodriguez local exciting there's going to be more Memo Rodriguez's. That's kind of the very loose pitch that I would be making here. Um, let's see as we continue to go. Uh, big picture comment from Alex Pacine. Style of play and preference are so important, but knowing when to take whatever they give you and being opportunistic is elite. Yeah, I, I think there's a balance, as we see, with the best of the best. Um Pep will be pragmatic when he has to, but he doesn't want to. Klopp will be pragmatic and go against what he wants to do when he has to, but he doesn't want to. And I think the best know when they're backed into that corner, know when they have to adapt a bit. But the best find a way to do it and stay true to their preference, their philosophy, their style, their work. I think the ones who are a little too whatever okay i'll take it and i'll make something out of it i think there's a lower ceiling for those kinds of managers and and teams i think you do have to know what you want to do and where you want to be and you have to give the manager the pieces to get to that point otherwise you hired the wrong guy um having somebody who is adaptable for colorado for example who's not going to spend a lot yeah you probably have to prioritize that but again the ceiling's just lower because Robin Frazier doesn't get to develop his game model really all that deep because, well, I might get this guy from another team in the league. I might get this guy. I might get this guy. I can't go and ask for these five players because I'm not going to get them. So I just got to deal with what I get. I'm a chef on Chopped, and it's going to be pretty good. But is it going to be, uh, you know, world-class elite restaurant? Probably not because you're not getting that kind of ingredient. So how do you deal with that? Um, the best get everything they want and then they're able to make it work and still adapt. The next best that can adapt, I think can make more out of what they have to work with than, than a manager who's too rigid, but there's just a lower ceiling on it. Um, got to buy into whatever you got to hire somebody that fits your philosophy as a club. You got to give them the ability to do their job. You got to give them the time to do their job. And if you don't, you're just imposing a lower ceiling on how successful it can be. That's from a broad, broad perspective. That's, that's my feeling on it. It doesn't have to be the style I like, the style John likes, the style that some other pundit likes. It, it's got to be what suits the club, and you got to be all in on it. You can't be halfway. And we've seen the halfway not work. Uh, Chris Armas in Toronto, that didn't make any sense from the beginning. It didn't last very long. Jesse Marsh at Leipzig. Leipzig had moved past, I think, where Marsh was and the way he wanted to approach the game. It didn't work. Rangnick at Manchester United. Look, Ralph is being a little more pragmatic than I thought he would be. But is it scintillating? No, it's not. It's okay. It's not bad. They, could, they should finish fourth. They have the talent to finish fourth. But it's not blowing your mind. You gotta, re if you're gonna... If you're going to go down the road with a manager, you got to buy into it all the way, and we'll see. Um, okay, I'm trying to get caught up just a little bit more before we go. Um, 
Niall says community building is important. It's part of what makes a club successful. Look at Atlanta United. It's not just the success on the field, but what they do off the field is what attracts so many people. 100%. You got to have the whole package. Um, at the heart of the biggest and best and most amazing clubs that have these relationships, it is personal. It is a relationship. And if you are an Atlanta person, you love to see Atlanta United invest in Atlanta. You love to see Arthur Blank invest in Atlanta and make it a better place. That's going to make you feel warmer and fuzzier about the club and the badge because they're doing good things in the community. You also have to be approachable and, and figure that out. Like, yes, there are clubs and maybe like the LA galaxy is an example of it. Although they do good work in the community too. I'm not trying to dismiss that, but LA is a different feel, you know, um, Real Madrid is a different feel than a, a Barcelona, for example, that has always said more than a club. Real Madrid is way up here. Um, I think some clubs in this country have tried to be way up here before they've earned the right to be way up here. Um, They've tried to be the Dallas Cowboys before they've won anything. But we see how that can also go the other way if you're not winning things. Because then you become very easy up on that hill to have people throw rocks at your house. Because you're not... You you don't have the, the quality to keep the walls up around your house to keep the rocks out. Rocks are hitting your house. It's something that, in my opinion, I love the clubs that have a personal feel. Uh, I love, you know, whether it's a grassroots club that you feel like you're at a game, you can walk up to the owner and have a conversation with them. Um, whether it's a, a bigger club, you feel like whether it's the way the club presents itself, the work they're doing in the community, et cetera, you feel like you know the decision makers. Um, these are all good things. Everybody's got their own personalities. Every club has to find their own way and in their market and solve it. But I think Leeds and Marcelo Bielsa and what we've seen from that is a prime example where it felt personal and it was personal for a lot of that fan base. And that's going to make it harder for Jesse Marsh. It can also create an opportunity. And I hope that it does. And I hope that they embrace him like they embraced Marcelo. And I hope that he can get the results and continue on because I think he does have some similarities in personality that Marcelo did. Marcelo wasn't Marcelo's not a naturally outgoing guy. You can watch the interviews with him. You can, you know, learn more about him. He's not, you know, gregarious. He knows what he can do and what he's comfortable with, but he's also just a nice guy. Like he'll hug the kids. He'll, you know, make time for the kids. He'll he'll do those kinds of things. But no, he's not a guy who's going to sit and have, you know, a long conversation with you at the pub. That's just, that's not him. That's not how he feels comfortable. Jesse, I think, is a very outgoing guy. I think if they really put him out there and give him the opportunity to interact with people, they'll come to like him. And I hope he gets it. And I hope he can continue to build on what has revitalized the club that needed it. They needed those relationships rebuilt and they've got them. And I hope Jesse can continue to build on it. And I hope that clubs look at what, happened with Leeds and Marcelo and understand that you can't force that, but when you get it, you got to ride it for all it's worth because it's special. It's really special. Yeah. Uh, Marcelo, but also the, the pictures were out there uh, after the announcement was made and they were transitioning to Jesse Marsh. He was out at the, the training ground and signing autographs and signing portraits of himself. And if there were fans that had embraced him for what he had done for Leeds getting them back to the Premier League, and he will always have that special place in their hearts. And so, yeah, he was out there just being a normal guy and just making sure that he was addressing everyone and giving everything everything that they were looking for. You know, hey, you want a picture? Great. You want a hug? Great. You want an autograph? Fantastic for that group. And I think that he will always be a part of it, a part of the fabric of Leeds United. And we ran Jesse Marsh's uh, initial comments from when he was signed at Leeds on Prem and Proper. And you can catch that on the on the network. And he's looking forward to uh, being there and embracing everything with the fans. And he, he understands it's a very special relationship that the fans have with this club. And, and from everything that Jesse said initially, he's ready to to dive in and be a part of that because he understands it and appreciates it going in as well. 
Last things uh, on the board. I'm with you, Burned. I think Alan Velasco will be a really fun player to watch in this league. He has arrived in Dallas. Uh, not sure if he'll factor in straight out of the gate. He's been playing for Independiente, so he should, I think. I think, I mean, he's been training with him at least in preseason. I think he played some in the Copa de la Liga. Um, shouldn't need a whole lot of fitness work. It's just, you know, the chemistry and, and connections. We'll see, but I'm excited to see him. I think he's a special one. I really do. And I think Dallas, because of him, because of Ariola, Palma call back healthy, what Jesus Ferreira can be. I think they're a playoff team. I think they could be a little bit of a surprise in the West. Um, Abby wanted an update on the soccer factory stuff. And thank you, Abby, for uh, getting deliveries done locally for us for that. I think everybody's got their shirts and I've seen a lot of people wearing them. It's very, very cool. Uh, shirts have been sent up to Mayfield as well. And uh, Coach Luis posted on Instagram, make sure you're following them and update. They've had some bad weather up there. It's been hard for them to really make a lot of progress on the cleanup, which is still continuing. I mean, you had a one of the most epic tornadoes that you can imagine in terms of size and strength roll through. Uh, the cleanup doesn't happen overnight. It's still happening. But you could see basically the foundation of where the soccer factory was um, it, all the way down to the ground. Um, a couple very short posts, though, that were left on the, the perimeter of it. Uh, so they're about ready to start kind of the next steps. Um, hopefully the weather will turn and they can get some good working days and get some things done. But we were able to, thanks to all of you, donate $750 to the Soccer Factory for that. I know a bunch of other people have made donations as well um, out of the SDH family. So thanks to all of you for doing that. We're going to continue to support them and figure out ways that we can do more for them. Um, I've tried to make some connections for them on on other things. Uh, I, I believe Soccer for Good OG is going to be making a trip up into that part of the the country sometime this spring. So we might do a donation drive for them. Stay tuned. But um, we're going to continue to support them and keep you posted on everything. But follow them on Instagram for updates. Uh, I shared it yesterday from mine at Long Shoes, so you can find them Soccer Factory KY on uh, on Twitter or on on on, on Instagram. I don't. Don't think they use Twitter too much. Uh, they're on Facebook as well, which they use a good bit. You can look them up there. Um, let's see. Last one. DM Tim. Thoughts on where Bielsa will go. Um, it's not one you can easily predict because he's not like he's not going to go to Manchester United. He's not going to go to Real Madrid. He's, he, it, that's a, those aren't the clubs for him. Um, it's probably going to be somebody that we don't expect. It probably will be. I don't think he'll go back to Mexico. He did that a long time ago. Like, he's not going to go to Club America. He wants no part of that chaos. Um, does he go back to Newell's at some point? It's possible, but he's talked about it. Tata Martino's talked about it. The toxic nature of how the game gets handled in Argentina at times drove both of them out years ago. Does it change now that they're legends? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I don't know. I mean, he did the national team thing with Chile for a long time. Maybe it, it's something like that. Uh, I don't really know. I think he's probably going to decompress a little bit first and be on the lookout for something for next season, whether it's in South America or in Europe. But it's got to be a club that's going to really completely buy in to what he's going to do. And it's got to be a club that doesn't expect him to be there for as long as he was at Leeds. That was the longest he's been anywhere in his career, but he can come in and be an agent of change for you. And you've got to really honestly have the plan of how you follow him up. And it sounds like Leeds had the plan with wanting to, to go with Marsh after he became available after the season. And it got accelerated because of four straight losses. So you got to have that in the back of your mind, but well, it could be anywhere. It could honestly be anywhere. We'll just have to see where this goes. Um, that'll do it. For us, uh, last piece of advice, and this comes from Alex Pacine, uh, do not throw eggs at weddings. If you're on the Discord, you know what we're talking about. Uh, we'll be back for stoppage time today, twitch.tv slash stoppage time 929, also on Facebook at 929 The Game. That's at 2 o'clock, myself and Mike Conti. I'll be on the midday show at 120 with Andy and Randy on 929 The Game on the Odyssey app. 7 o'clock, twitch.tv slash ATLUTD. I'm going to try to host that on our soccer down here Twitch as well. Um, Atlanta United 2 and Chattanooga Red Wolves playing at 7 o'clock tonight, preseason friendly. And I will tease you with this as we leave. Make sure you turn your notifications on for ATLUTD too. Uh, there could be something popping up here pretty soon. 
with a couple of maybe signings for the season. Maybe one of them that you saw in the game on Saturday, if you watched, because he was on trial in that game. And we'll see if uh, things have progressed. Be on the lookout. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, we have Jillian Sakovitz joining us. We have Kevin Egan joining us. Nice. Very busy day tomorrow busy. on SDH, as well as Nico Moreno joining us. Very, very busy day on the show tomorrow. Be with us at 9.05. See you then. Mooch plot, y'all. Mooch plot, y'all.